Committee, while we're waiting. Madam um, for, Chair, we are live. Okay, thank you. Welcome everybody to uh, Travel, Recreation, Wildlife and Cultural Resources. Good morning to everybody in the room. Good morning to anybody listening online. And if staff would please call the roll. Senator Guru. Here. Senator Landon. Here. Senator Salazar. Here. Senator Schuler. Here. Representative Banks. Here. Representative Haroldson. Here. Representative Hunt. Here. Representative Jennings. Here. Representative Knapp. Here. Representative Newsom. Here. Representative Sweeney. Uh, excuse, he'll be here shortly. Representative Winter. Here. Madam uh, Chairwoman Ellis. Here. Madam Chairwoman Flitner. Present. Love that. Thank you, Mary Beth. There he is. Representative Sweeney has arrived. Uh, again, good morning, everybody. Before we start, you'll all notice there was a handout in front of you uh, from uh, Golden Creek Equine. And um, if anyone is interested in stopping by there on the drive home, uh, they are more, ha more than happy to host you. They just like to have an idea if anybody might be interested. So uh, just let us know before the day is out if you do plan to make a stop to look at their horse facility. Um, any comments or questions from the committee this morning before we dive into things. Thanks again to Chairman Ellis and her work that she did yesterday. Thanks to the committee. So as you all know, we've been tasked by Management Council to take a look at uh, House Enrolled Act 50 online sports wagering from our 2021 Wyoming um, uh, session that was just completed. And so we have in our midst this morning, Director Moore with the Wyoming Gaming Commission and Director Moore, if you please join us. Thank you for being here. And committee, I had also sent you an email with a link to um, House Bill 133 online sports wagering if you were so inclined and wanted to get yourselves back up to speed on the legislation. Uh, but Director Moore, if you would introduce yourself for the record and, and introduce your guests and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for having me here today. My name is Charlie Moore. I'm the director of the Wyoming Gaming Commission. With me today, I have President Bob Davis, Commissioner on the Gaming Commission. And then I have on my left here, Special Agent Lara Mendy, Agent for the Gaming Commission. Again, thank you very much, and I do appreciate this. Um, you know, I, I had uh, someone ask me the other day, um, is this what you signed up for? And interesting enough, at the time, my answer was no, not necessarily because it was 15 years ago. But you know what? I'm exactly where I want to be today. Um, and thank you to you all, the faith you have placed in the agency um, and, and your patience with the agency. But yes, we are exactly where we want to be. We're working on trying to fulfill your mandates. <clears throat> I do appreciate your time and your interest. It's busy times to say the least for us. We have live racing opening tomorrow in Gillette, Wyoming. That starts our 50 day season um, again tomorrow. Live racing um, commencing and we're co coordinating with the permittees and the operators on our safety initiatives and our regulatory safeguards that go into place. The commission employs veterinarians, safety officers, event judges, and with a focus on keeping a safe environment for the equine and human athletes. Our summer season of live racing is here and it is exciting times. However, I do know we're here today to speak about online sports wagering in the other side of the house. And, you know, again, it is exciting. Sports wagering is, is an event uh, that is um, been tasked. Currently, we are working through the rule process. We've had several meetings. We've had a, had a few um, uh, stakeholder meetings and getting comments. We're on track right now to be able to fulfill our September 1st deadline, um, hopefully. Again, it, it's dependent on a lot of people and a lot of work. Um, we have over 70 pages of rules that we have put together for the sports wagering. 
we have contracted with an outside entity to assist us in that process. Um, they're experts in the field. And uh, we're, we're just moving forward. We had a very productive commission meeting last week where we spent several hours on the rules, walked through those line by line, page by page, and took comments and uh, questions and concerns from the public and from the commissioners. Um, we are hopeful that next week we're receiving some comments from a couple of the major um, interests in sports wagering. We've gotten uh, one of those uh, public comments in um, this week yet. And we'll have some more maybe this afternoon or the first of the week on our rules and regulations. Hopefully, if we can keep on track, we will have the rules ready and prepared to go towards the governor's desk on the first, and that's our goal. Um, if we can get them headed that way by then, then we're, we should be in pretty good shape for the September deadline. So I'm, I'm pleased with that. Sports wagering, um, again, very interesting subject. Uh, at times, it's, it's a little, little scary when we're, we're learning a whole new task and, and working on this. Uh, the operators um, out there have been very, very helpful working with us, educating the commission, educating my staff. And uh, we've worked with other uh, state agencies, working closely with the state to the south of us. It has, has very good experience with sports wagering, working with uh, the state to the north east of us, um, and also other states around the country gleaming their rules. The rules that we, we pulled together, we pulled together partially from uh, Colorado, Tennessee, Michigan, and uh, we, we tried to put those together. Um, and, and come up with something that, that the uh, operators were used to, and it was an industry um, standards. So again, we're in a good place with those rules. I can't, I, and I know I've repeated it a couple of times, um, I'm, and I would stand for questions at this point. Committee, questions for Director Moore? Yes, Senator, go ahead. Uh, Madam Chair, Chairman, thank you. Uh, Appreciate you guys being here this morning. Boy, what a time. Uh, I guess the big question for me is, um, how's it all going? And, and um, do we have enough man and wom woman power for you guys to do all of what we have dumped on the table? Mm -hmm. It just feels like a lot to me. And I'm, you know, I'm not applying any grease or anything. I'm just wondering how, are we gonna be able to carry the water up the hill. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about what the expectations are and, and whether or not you've got the, the folks to do it. Director Moore. Thank you. Thank uh, you, Mr. Chairman Moore. Flittner, Senator Landon. Again, thank you for the question. Uh, the short answer is we don't have enough staffing at this point. Um, but to expand on that, um, we're getting there. Um, I, had, I had done a, uh, we did a B11 um, a month and a half ago, two months ago to add three additional staff members on. Um, we have expanded our office space to accommodate that. With that expansion, we have brought on one, in, one individual at this time, or two, excuse me. We have another investigator, inspector that we brought on board. And, and these people are not just sports wagering. These are people that are working in multiple, multiple venues, working on the skill side and the horse racing side. Um, we just recently brought on another individual that had been working in the uh, um, legal field. It's a uh, paralegal that's working for us, helping us with the rules and the regulations and the process of that. Not the rules so much, but the process. Um, getting those, you know, the the public comments, posting those, posting meetings. So we are getting there. Um, I have to approach things um, in the way I've always done it and, and, and learned in business is with a phased approach to regulation and to, to any kind of a business. So the first phase, obviously with this, with the sports wagering specifically was um, to get the rules in place. Um, the next phase, which will be coming quickly 
is start working on the licensing phase of that. But then along with this all, we have to be continually mindful that we're gonna be live and up and running, you know, September, those are the goal, kind of the goal dates. So we have to have more staffing on board. So we're looking at outsourcing some of that, utilizing some, some uh, contracted labor um, to do that. Currently, again, a, a bit of the dilemma that I run into with employees and staffing is beings that it, it, it wasn't appropriated additional staffing, um, I have to, to um, I can get the positions, but they're positions that are an AWAC position. So what does that mean? Um, it, you probably all know what I'm talking about, but if you don't, um, you know, it's basically a non-benefited position. Well, trying to bring in good people at a high level from other parts of the state or wherever, you know, that doesn't, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's just not sometimes practical. I've been fortunate. We're drawing on um, retired uh, law enforcement. So that's not as important for those, for the, uh, some of our oversight and boots on the ground stuff, which doesn't necessarily apply to the online sports wagering, but still it helps relieve other people to go and do their tasks. So, you know, we've been fortunate. And then just recently I had my uh, chief financial officer, um, my uh, senior accountant resigned to go to a federal job, um, again, more money, um, benefits and things. So I, I lost a very, um, you know, very pivotal, um, really good person there. So we're scrambling. Um, I've scrambled all my life. We will continue to, and we'll continue to keep the mission. And the mission is, uh, you know, protect the wagering public and keep focused on our, our goals. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Senator Lamb. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Just a, a quick follow up. And I appreciate sort of a 30,000 foot view as we before we launch into this. What's your biggest concern at this point? And is it realistic for us to hit a, a deadline of September for something as big as sports wagering? Director Moore. Chairman Flitner, uh, Senator Landon, again, gr great question. Um, yeah, I think, I think we can do that. We're going to do that. Um, we're going to have the rules in place. We're going to be ready. Um, you know, for some of you that maybe know me, um, very driven, um, somewhat to a fault maybe at times, but uh, we're going to get that goal. We're going to do it. And we're going to do it um, not in a... Um, we're going to do it in a good way. Let's just put it that way. Um, we're going to have good rules in place. We're going to have good oversight. And we're going to rely on outsourcing some of our, our contracts that we need to oversee this. One of the plans with the sports wagering is, is part of the auditing of the systems requirements. And we're going to, I'm, I'm hopeful that we will have that in rules to where an independent third party auditor is doing that. Then we're also looking at it along with that, but we have a third party approved auditing firm that will review the systems and review those systems um, annually to make sure that they're operating at that high level. And, and at this point, you know, with those systems, because they are at, at such a high level, you know, we have to rely on, on some of those those independent auditors to give us that information. So um, lots of moving parts, relying on, on some very knowledgeable people in the world um, to bring that information to us and protect the public. Thank you, yes, Thank Senator you. Grew. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Good morning, Director Moore. Um, I wanted to ask, go back to something you said earlier, just to make sure I have it straight in my head, you said, or I heard you say, that uh, you b 11 three positions? Yes. Is that true? Like I'm follow up. Chairman Flitner, Senator Group. yes. Like I'm follow up? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, so b 11 three positions, and those were AWAC positions? Chairman Flitner, Senator, yes. Go ahead. One more. In your in this year's budget, in your July first budget, were the did you have new positions in, in, that were approved in that budget? Director Moore, Chairman Flitner, Senator, no, we did not have any positions eliminated. Is that so one more? Go ahead. So, go ahead. Go. <laughs> so, question is: these three AWAC positions. 
So this is a temporary situation. These folks now just during, you said, uh, or what I heard you say was it not just for this rulemaking and hitting the September 1st deadline, which we've talked about before, but more just because of the influx of work in the office right now, but this is a, these three positions you see going on until when? Director Moore, <laughs> Chairman Flitner, Senator, yes, forever. What what it will do, and, and, and again, you on appropriations committee, you, you all understand how the process works. You know, I will be coming to you for, at the next uh, budget cycle with those positions, asking for those positions to be continued on, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Chairman Ellis, did you have a question? Uh, thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Um, kind of a piggybacking off uh, the question brought by my good colleague from Natrona County. I think this kind of highlights, you know, when we set a statutory deadline so quickly of September 1st to have your work, um, you know, if you read the Administrative Procedures Act, it's supposed to be act like a funnel as you narrow in on the date of issuing your final rule. And there's always a concern that at the end of that process, you'll receive new information or substantially change the rule. And if you do that, you're supposed to go out for another 45 day comment period. And that's important so that the public can weigh in and you can't you know, substantially change something at the finish line without having it be subject to scrutiny. So I guess, uh, Director Moore, you know, I am um, a little concerned just because it's such a huge undertaking. Um, I did send committee members, I didn't realize it wasn't included in your meeting materials, the draft 62 page um, rule that you're working on for sports wagering. But just, I guess the ask is if you start running into difficulty in seeing in completing that work by September 1st, um, you know, I would ask that you reach out to our committee and let us know because, um, you know, I've seen this in other rulemakings where we should do it right. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously that September 1st makes that a little bit of a challenge. So um, just your thoughts on just that time frame. I know it's aggressive, but we want to make sure we do, we do it right. Director Moore. Chairman Flitner, uh, Co-Chairman Ellis, you know, again, great. You know, I'm, I'm very familiar with the rulemaking process as, as a lot of people are. And, and you're absolutely correct, 100%. Um, the public, and, and that's why we have, have gone the route we have with the stakeholders. Um, and then also that public 45 day public comment is the most important piece to that. And at any point in time, if we have, have a group of uh, 20 or more that request to have another hearing, that's exactly what we would do. So I will keep you all apprised of the situation and continue down that process. And, you know, the, the September 1 deadline is, you know, it's, it's I don't like it. Um, it puts a lot of pressure. Um, and when there's pressure like that, you end up, people get left out. Um, things happen in, in the rules. Um, you know, there's, there's just problems with it. There's a reason that we have that process um, and it's protect our Wyoming citizens and give them that opportunity. So thank you and I will, absolutely. Madam Co-Chair, yes. Um, Madam Co-Chair, another question. So in just watching the news, I'm sure many people in the room are aware that Tennessee mm -hmm. set up their sports betting system and then had to yank some permits because of some concerns about um, you know, the permit holders and, and things that they weren't aware of. And so in trying to do some research on this, I don't know that I fully understand what happened in Tennessee, but I'm wondering if your commission has looked at that instance and made, and are contemplating how we can stay ahead of that so that we're not finding, in ourse finding ourselves in a position of having to backtrack. Um, so if you have any thoughts about um, your research and what you're doing to make sure we prevent something like that from happening in Wyoming, I'd be curious. Director Moore. Chairman Flitner, Co-Chairman Ellis, uh, absolutely. Um, I've reached out to Tennessee. I'm expecting a call back any day um, on some clarification there in that situation. You know, the, the difference is that we have um, is that the operators are in three jurisdictions currently operating. So we do have the benefit of that in the statutes. So that, that puts us up at a at a bit of a higher place, I hope. Um, and, you know, in the last meeting, we were talking about the temporary permitting and some of those things. That's where I have a little concern or a lot of concern. You know, you either permit or you don't. 
Um, and But that was a suggestion, so we put it out there for discussion. But yeah, absolutely, backtracking is horrible, especially as you know from being a regulator and myself as a regulator for years as well. When you backtrack, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's not good. Follow question. Mm -hmm. And when I find out more, I'll get to you. Thank you. I'd appreciate that. I, I don't know that I quite understand what happened in Tennessee still. So if you've put, if you've done some research on that, I, I just don't understand what happened there. So um, my other question though, is along those lines. Um, so for committee members who aren't aware, I spent a brief amount of time working for the National Indian Gaming Commission. And an issue came up during your last commission meeting last week that I listened to. And it dealt with whether or not commission staff and commissioners can participate in sports betting and actually utilize the technology and place those bets. In the NIGC world, um, just for committee's awareness, we were not allowed to gamble in any Indian casino. And we were not allowed to gamble um, with any uh, company that has a management contract with an Indian casino, which is at the time the big ones, right? And so you go to Vegas and there's no putting a dollar in a slot machine. There's no bet, placing a bet anywhere. And I'm not a gambling lady, so that was fine with me. But um, that's the extent of that prohibition. And so that came up during your commission meeting. I'm curious to know what further discussions you've had and whether you're gonna make that requirement for your, not only commission staff, but your commissioners. Director Moore. Chairman Flitner, Co-Chairman Ellis. Um, again, uh, you know, for me and my whole life as a regulator, I haven't been allowed to gamble. And, and in Wyoming, I've chosen not to. You know, I choose not to. Um, anyway, so, um, and you're absolutely correct. Uh, the majority or a lot of the states do not allow for staff or commissioners to gamble. In the horse racing world, that's very prevalent, um, but it's about a 50-50. In Wyoming, what we have in our statutes, and I don't have the citation in front of me right now, um, with the paramutual side, well, it's, it's on the commission side now. Um, you know, we commissioners can, can voice their conflict of interest. And if they've been at the races or they've been involved, then they need to recuse themselves from any adjudication with that. So um, at the next meeting that comes up, it, we're going to be scheduling it next week, Thursday or Wednesday, Thursday or Friday next week, it depends. Um, we're going to be discussing that in depth uh, again, and uh, we'll, we'll see where it, where it comes. Senator Schuler. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, my question is, I appreciate your positive attitude. I think it's amazing that you, all the things that we've thrown at you and you're, you're willing to jump in and, and make some things happen regardless of the time crunch. Uh, I guess what I'm wondering is, uh, you know, with all of that coming at you as fast as it is, uh, I guess I'd like to know what some of the negative things are. If we had to do some prosecutions, if we had some issues, uh, how have you dealt with it? Has our uh, the bill that we passed with the modifications, has that helped or hindered you? Uh, some information on that, it'd be great. Chairman Flitner, Senator, um, <clears throat> again, thank you. Um, we've had some prosecutions that we've been dealing with. Mr. Laramandi maybe can allow the the pending cases, he could speak to that. Um, we have some terminals that we have confiscated and, and have in- And Dr. Up. Moore specifically, we're speaking to skills games correctly, correct? That would be okay. just the general gambling, right. yes, thank you. Um, so the negative side, um, right now with the sports bet, with the sports wagering side of it, we're, we're just involved in, in getting the rules put together and focused on that. So, you know, I, I think the bill was very well put together. It seems like we have all the, the safeguards um, that we need in place, but we're learning as we go. Um, we're learning, you know, the nature of it, the people involved. Um, and, and again, one thing that, that we find, um, you know, from gleaming, um, information from other states, and the bill said to do that, basically. You know, we're, we're getting caught up to speed very quickly. Um, we've had quite a few learning sessions, uh, webinars with uh, the GeoComply people, um, with, uh, you know, just Sports Betting 101, and we're going to start producing those and putting those on our YouTube channel so you all can look at those and get a little more understanding into that. 
Um, with, with sports wagering, it, it's, it's real interesting. Um, the geolocating services that they utilize, we can sit in our offices and watch that function. We can watch those wagers real time drop. Um, it's, it could be on the, the TV monitors right here. You can see that. And in the demo that they showed us, uh, you could see where a wager was being placed on the bridge um, going from New York to New Jersey and the, the wager was denied. But then you could see all of a sudden it, it appeared, you could see that, that the individual was driving and they had made it to New Jersey and that wager was then placed again. And you could see where that wager was live and was accepted. So, so the technology is amazing. Um, and again, we're only as good as that technology. So you, uh, you have to have some faith in that but it seems to be working in other jurisdictions. And we're, we're trying to get a really good understanding of the problems um, and, and the pluses and minuses of it. I, I'm not sure if I fully answered your question. Okay. Thank you, Senator Salazar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Quick question, do you have any um, projected revenues for the future in the, in the coming months and years? Um, Chairman Flitner, Senator, um, I don't right at this point. I do have um, our first quarter revenues that are horse racing and skill games. If you'd like to like to hear some of that, I do have that um, for you today. The first quarter of this year um, on the skill-based amusement games, the 20% tax, 45% uh, of that tax went to the city and county. It's $531,000. The other 45% that goes to the school foundation account is $531,000 and change. And then the 10% goes to the gaming account, which is $118,000. That's in the, the first quarter for skill-based amusement game taxes. Now on the gaming account, understand that we have a tip over in that account. Once that account gets to a certain amount, um, it rolls over to the LISRA. So we are transferring to the LISRA um, each quarter as well. Our first quarter transfer to the LISRA out of our 049 account, which is our operating account, was $387,000. Um, on the horse racing side of the house, the uh, historic racing, <clears throat> the Breeders Award Fund, which I don't know if you know, that's an incentive program that, that is out there that was passed several years ago to incentivize the breeding of horses in our state. That accumulated $943,000. The gaming account, which is a 25%, um, there was a quarter percent, excuse me, was $589,000. The other quarter percent goes to the LISRA, $589,000. And then the 1% that goes to the cities and counties and our municipalities was $2.3 million. So last year with the, the pandemic, um, when we realized the dire straits that we were all in, we went ahead and transferred early. We're typically making some of these transfers from these accounts. Um, the, some of them require us to transfer the rollover every quarter but typically our other transfers are every six months and that's been consistent what we have done. So what we did last September, or excuse me, not last September, um, last spring is we knew that the wagering activity with the historic racing had stopped for the time being. And so we went ahead and transferred three months early to the cities and counties um, that, that fund. So we wanted to get that out and help all of our municipalities. So. That's the 30,000 foot view on, on a lot of that. The anticipated revenues at this point um, for the, the uh, online sports wagering, it, it's hard to, to really contemplate it because you know, it, the projections seem to be quite high and, and they appear to be what you see from the Oxford report and different reports. However, that's reliant on on, on moving people from the regula, regula, unregulated market, excuse me, to a regulated market. So that takes time. Um, that, that's opportunities, that's advertising for the sports wagering vendors. 
and and that takes time to move those people into the legal market. Thank you, and Director Moore. Would you mind emailing the dollar figures that you just cited Sorry. for the committee for the first quarter? Thank you, uh, Representative Jennings, and then uh, Vice Chairman Newsom. Thank you, Madam Chairman, <clears throat> um, Director Moore. Good to have you here this morning. So, mine's just kind of a humorous personal edification here. So I, I appreciate um, co-chairman sending us this working draft on rules. So just very briefly, and I was perusing through it, I noticed on page nine that um, line C says, no permit under the permits generally, no permit will be granted to anyone less than 16 years of age if the employment will violate the child labor laws of the state of Wyoming. And we struck that out. So just for my own personal edification in that, are we, uh, I mean, I, I have a grandson that's 11 years old that clearly could do better with computer than me. And so are we planning on a whole bank of eight-year-olds getting some of these permits or Director why Mark, would we strike that out? <laughs> you know, Chairman Flitner, uh, Representative Jennings, that, that created some discussion the other day. So that's why it's noted as, as stricken at this point. Um, I do have in my copy um, 18 now, um, but we're waiting on clarification from the Attorney General's office to uh, get make sure we have that correct language and, and see. I don't know if that answered your question. The reality is um, we're not gonna be permitting anyone at that age, and, and that was the part of the discussion as well. Representative Jennings, are you disappointed by the fact that you can't uh, employ your grandson? Uh, Madam Chairman, the, at the rate that our government has spent, I was thinking that maybe we should employ eight-year-olds a little quicker, get them into the workforce. There was a start time. Start paying some taxes. Right. Vice Chairman Newsom. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I was wondering about the makeup of the commission and when the commissioners that are now currently seated, the only charge you had was historic horse racing and, and live horse racing. Now that we've expanded to skills games and now to online sports wagering, do you believe that, your, that the commission members would be better served having a specific skill set rather than geographic location? Um, I know some of, some of the boards and some of the commissions the memberships made up of, of people with a specific skill set, and maybe sometimes in addition to a geographic location. But I'm wondering if you think that would make for better decision making of the commission. Thank you. Thank you, Director Moore. Chairman Flitner, Representative Newsom. Uh, you know, you're you're absolutely correct. Um, as as you and I had had some conversations on this. Um, you know how I have always looked at this for a number of years is didn't necessarily need a person that was, that had, you know, they, they needed to understand horses when we were doing primarily that, you know, but it, it was, I always, good business sense, um, people that can deal with complicated problems um, and, and those type of, of individuals seem to work really well. Having some ag interest too as well is important. We're working from, from horses on one side to, you know, very technical, very high end on another side of the house. And, and I'm fortunate that I've, I've got both sides of that. And I'm kind of some days floundering in, in, in between there a little bit. But I think it is important to, to have experience currently. Um, I'm very fortunate that I have um, uh, Commissioner Wildcat, who is on the uh, involved in the, the tribal casino and has been a regulator for years um, and understands gaming and gaming issues, um, also horse issues too. So I'm very fortunate to have that on our, our commission, but I, I think it is important. Um, the difficulties we find sometimes in Wyoming is, is we're you know, a small state, but you know, as this grows, I think there's going to be more people that are interested, whether it's you all um, or, or whoever that, that start to understand and, and start learning and, and get that knowledge, that knowledge base. So to answer your question, I think it is important to have some skill sets. Um, it's, it's not uncommon. It's, we're doing it in multiple other, other boards and commissions. So short answer, yes. 
Committee, further questions? Yes, Senator Landon. Mm. Oh, sorry. Thank you. That's the governor calling. It is. It is. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Madam <laughs> Chairman. Um, I, the, the representative from the Northwest brings up something that I think we may want to think about. That, because I think it's set up geographically now, is it not, Director Moore? Chairman Moore. Flitner, uh, Senator Landon, yes, it's uh, the Senate districts. I, I, um, I would suggest that, that maybe that's not as necessary as, say, on select water or even school facilities or many of these other uh, boards and commissions that we do set up. I, I would think that maybe a knowledge base is perhaps more important than geographic. But um, that's something we may, may want to think about. But Madam Chairman, if I could just ask another 30,000 foot view question. Uh, Director Moore, uh, I've thought a lot about this gaming issue since I was asked to move on to this committee. And I think I have it formulated in my mind correctly, but I hope you will correct me if I'm right. I think, we, I think this, this whole, Paramutual horse racing venture has been a success. I don't even know if we thought it would be as successful as it was when we ran that legislation years ago. Um, so I'm I'm kind of proud of that. Um, I'm so so I see that as as this pillar over here, and now as of about three or four years ago, we stood up this brand new thing, which had already made it into our state, but we decided to tackle it in a more regulatory or oversight fashion, and that's the skill game industry. Um, is it possible for those two things to coexist um, without one feeding off the other? And um, do you feel like we can grow both? And, uh, and make this work in Wyoming. Dr. Moore. Chairman Flitner, Senator Landon. I do think they can grow together. Um, we're seeing, you know, while we don't have the history of uh, like we have with historic horse racing, um, we're not seeing, th there was concerns for a long time of cannibalization. Um, and that's always a concern. I, I know I only have so much money in my pocket to spend. Um, so there, there is that concern. Um, but we're not seeing, at least at this point, cannibalization of historic horse racing. We're not seeing that that is a problem. Um, now, um, they've been setting, you know, each, seems like each month we have, have another, um, layer of, of holy cow we hit a we hit a huge huge level again with historic racing and and also i'm very proud and in, in the numbers show it um with the skill-based amusement games um they're doing quite well um in the locations you know in the future if you if we start growing um some of this more my concern has always been and this is you know, as a as me as a regulator, um, what a, what does the landscape look like in Wyoming? How do we want it to look? Well, that's your job. That's you all to sit there and and look at this, have those hard discussions. Do you want more? Do you want less? How do you want to see it uh, laid out? And and give them us the direction. This is this is what you want. Um, so back to your questions, you know, the cannibalization doesn't appear to be there right now. Um, not that it couldn't happen. Um, I can't say that with the tribal casinos. Um, if they're seeing downturns, um, and again, I'm not, I'm just speculating. They've been closed quite a lot more and, and you know, someone here in, on your, the committee may have more knowledge of that than I do, but sports wagering, is that gonna, gonna be an issue and, and cannibalize some of this as well? Um, it, it doesn't appear to be, and it doesn't seem to be that way um, in other states right now. So time will tell, we'll see what the Wyoming citizens do, I guess. 
Thank you, uh, Representative Haroldson. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Director, question. So obviously we're, we're building a, a, a rule platform for September, but providers are what are gonna be needed to actually operate this, correct? Am I correct in that assumption as far as there's gonna be people that'll come in that will run this online sports wagering in the state, is that correct? Director Moore. Chairman Flitner, if I heard your question right, I, yes. The answer would be yes. Okay, then a follow up. No. Yes, sir. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Director, so do we have anyone that's reached out to the state at this point saying, hey, we're interested in being in the state of Wyoming with, with this, this platform? Yes, Chairman Flitner, uh, Representative Haroldson. Yes, um, we've had multiple companies that have reached out to us. They're operating in multiple jurisdictions. Uh, currently in the state to the south, I think they have 26 online sports wagering. Uh, permittees there, um, but they also do a brick and mortars there as well, and we're not, but we've got currently uh, BetMGM, DraftKings, FanDuel, uh, so on and so forth, so. Okay, uh, Chairman Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, or Madam Chair. Um, so I guess, you know, Senator Landon again touched on something that is kind of interesting, um, you know, because we talked about number of machines. Can you tell me how many HHR machines or new machines have been coming online? And I'll be specific um, in my community on you know a major uh, street. Uh, we had a, an old Pier One building, and from what I keep hearing, there's going to be a, a new HHR machine facility um, coming online. So I'm just kind of curious if you could give us some information about how many new um, you've authorized, where there's a where there's going to those are going to be located. And just kind of, you know, to piggyback off that and remind the committee, um, you know, with skill games, we capped it um, at a point in time. You had to have applied by mid-May of 2020. And if you didn't apply before then and get approved, there's no mechanism for you to reapply or to expand those. And so when we talk about growing them together, we've definitely created a system where one can grow and another can't. And so um, to put a finer point on that, how do we grow skill games in your mind then if we wanna maintain some control over the number that are available um, or like just letting the private sector figure that out. Yeah. Director Moore. Chairman Flitner, uh, co-chairman Ellis. Uh, currently right now, we have three live event locations in the state. We have 20 off-track wagering locations in the state. And I can, I'll email this information to you all. Thank you. <clears throat> we have, uh, 1,265 historic horse racing terminals operating throughout the state right now. Skill game side of the house, we have 10 vendors. Currently, we have 306 locations, 836 terminals. So, you know, what you'd, what you'd asked, and, and I can get the, the site specifics for you all too, we'll break that down. We've got, I just don't have that today, you know, here in Cheyenne and in every county, that's, a, that's real easy. We'll get that emailed to you the, either yet this week or the first to next. But, you know, that, that poses a question that's always been concerning for me is with skill games. Here we have a situation to where games that were in place prior to the signing of the bill were, grand, were basically, I guess, grandfathered. What, they were allowed to continue operation as long as they, they fell in to the categories. Um, but we also had, and this speaks to the growth, we, we had a lot of people that said, hey, wait a minute, we're concerned. We have a problem with this. We're concerned about the gray area of the games. So those individuals decided whatever road it is um, to take, and they decided not to put those terminals in their locations. They were concerned whether they were concerned of liquor licenses or, or just, just they weren't familiar with the product at this point in time. So now we have skill games um, and that are operating. We're reviewing. Um, the denied applications, we're currently doing that. But then we have the individuals that just sat back waiting to see what happens and then they're still excluded, at least at this point. So, you know, it, it, I, I, don't, I don't know how that, it all kind of 
fits in there to that expansion. But, you know, I, I think that I have brought up typically every other, every few years to the commissioners, um, do we want to look at capping the amounts? Do we want to look at some of that? And, you know, whenever the discussion has come up, it's always been let the free market system work that out. And, and I believe in that, but also on the other hand, you know, the gaming world and people that have been involved in gaming understand this. Um, it's a very highly regulated market. And if you, in, in our, uh, the gaming report, I even have, have a section that I, I put in there that talks about the highly regulated market to where, where it's a little different than liquor licenses. It's different than, than other licenses. They're limited. And if you get a gaming license, uh, it's, it, it's a big deal and it should be, um, and it's supposed to be. So, you know, I can't necessarily answer the question as far, these are questions that you all need to contemplate, numbers, limit it and do those things. We are seeing some of our counties now um, looking at it in a little different way maybe. Of, of looking at maybe limiting some of the activities and doing some things. So um, I'm not sure if I really hit on it for you. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair, just to follow up. Um, and, and you touch on it, that, that you're re-reviewing the denied applicants mm -hmm. and Senate file 56 section four made it clear that, you know, the legislature told you to say, okay, we've now required Administrative Procedures Act um, we're going to build in a little grace period, recognizing when we went through COVID and there was concerns in some of the litigation about the exact date that certain information and materials were received. So we added some grace period in there. But one thing that I know is continuing a lingering source is the commission's ability to refute a lab report. And during the work I did on Senate file 56, you know, that issue has caused me great, a, a great amount of pause. Um, you know, a lot of, um, discussion that went on during last year's TRW interim, that issue wasn't really brought to the commission. So my understanding was your agency asked um, the TRW committee to insert language, making it clear that you had that authority. And so you and I have discussed this in light of the fact that knowing you'd have to write rules for that and be working on sports betting too, I think our intention was for you to rely on those reports. And so now I keep hearing more concern that you, the, your agency is still maintaining its position that it has the expertise and authority to refute the findings of a lab report. So can you talk to me a little bit about some of that legal theory? And I'm gonna just express my frustration because I have a, a document that you emailed me and it says the commission does not have a preference on whether the commission or the lab has a final say, but feels clarification in the law is necessary to minimize litigation as to the issue. And going on to the next page, it says, if the legislature would like the commission to make the ultimate determination, here's some suggested language. And so you put any skill-based amusement game that does not meet the requirements of this article, and then the inserted language, as determined by the commission, shall be immediately removed from the state. So we made a policy choice in Senate File 56 to not include that language, because we did have a preference, and I had a preference. Um, but I feel like we're stuck on this issue. And so tell me how we get past this. Um, you know, and I, I don't think it's my interpretation. This is how I presented the bill to my colleagues in the Senate and how when I took the bill over to our House counterparts and presented it in their committee, this was the exact presentation. And so that's why I'm so baffled at why we're still stuck on that issue. Director Moore. Chairman Flitner, uh, Co-Chairman Ellis. You know, we've, we've had, had some conversations on this and, you know, first off, state agency takes its legal guidance from the attorney general's office. And throughout this whole process, their office has, has reviewed every step of the way what we have done. I am very confident that, you know, and it's, it's not one person, it's not two, it's not three, it's four or five or six have reviewed the processes and read the, pl the plain reading of the law. So, with the lab reports, um, it was quite interesting. You know, we had had some meetings and we're reviewing those applications. We've been in the process of reviewing the applications um, we sent on February 9th, or excuse me, April 9th. We sent a letter to all the denied applicants, letting them know that we are opening it up 
dusting off those applications and we're starting to review those. On 4-21, April 21st, we sent packets to each one of the denied applicants. Um, in those packets, we had the background questionnaires. We had, uh, you know, different information for them to fill out. One of the pieces that, uh, that the legislation this year um, had, us, uh, had us look at is if the games are still in the same physical condition. So we had a certification in there. Are the games that you have um, in the same physical condition they were from the original lab report? So we knew that. Well, something that came up this week was, was we find out is the lab report that had been submitted to us um, didn't necessarily have all the function in reviews. Um, it wasn't completed as far as I was concerned. So, and after hearing of what was missing in it, it, it appears that this would have been extremely helpful information for us last year. Um, and, you know, I'm I, at this point sitting here right today, you know, I'm, I'm confident that this, this has the, the, the opportunity to go totally opposite direction because of the information that wasn't in the report. So the reports are, in, they're, are important. Um, we do have the expertise to understand it, but we do have to rely on those lab reports for that technical high level, as, as we do and we're going to do with sports wagering, as we do with historic racing. Um, I review, and I don't know the number, in the last year, I've probably reviewed a thousand reports um, with, and again, to, to kind of give you a uh, an idea of the volume with historic racing. Um, anytime we have a software upgrade, they do a report from the laboratory and submit that to the commission. If it's a cloning of a currently approved machine to where it's just basically, you know, appearance has no game function changes, that's an in-house, the commission has given the staff the authority to go ahead and authorize that. Um, if it's a change in the mathematical um, equations and the math models um, or the wagering profiles, that is something that we review along with the laboratory, and then we submit those um, to the commission for their approval. And the question is probably, have you ever, have you ever denied any of those? Yes, we have. Absolutely, we've done that. Um, so then, then, and there's a reason I'm, I'm going down this path so you understand, I think, is so whenever we have software updates, it's incredibly important to know that the right software has been installed on the machine. So when you're finished doing an install, every one of those machines that are in the historic racing side of the house has their signatures. The signatures is like a brand or a VIN number. For, for, for even, a, that, that's really exactly what it is. It's a VIN number for that software. So we verify that. And now it's verified through a third party, through Gaming Laboratories International, but the results are sent to us and we're monitoring that, spot checking that. Throughout the year, Mr. Laramendi, um, Mr. Steinberg, and Mr. Hotard are out around verifying signatures on, on every terminal. They're doing that as well with the historic, or excuse me, with the skill-based amusement games. Um, so, you know, this whole, the lab reports are, are important. Um, we do review those and we, we sit down and, and look at those reports and, and spend time with the laboratory, speaking to the, the engineers at the laboratory. And then again, like I said, you know, we found out this week, this, this report here had some missing items in it. And, and it, was, it, was, it was not the fault of the individuals by any means. It was timing that we had. We we're all under this incredibly quick turnaround. And they thought that probably that wasn't necessary. Well, after hearing about it, it looks like it's a very, it's, it's something that would have taken a whole different direction. Go ahead. Just a follow-up. I think what I'm hearing is just a 180, though, of what you told me when we were working on the bill. We don't have a preference 
if you decide to do this, if the legislature decides to do this, here's some language. Now I'm hearing, no, we have a preference. We want to be able to do this. I mean, if you had told the committee and the legislature this, we specifically want this language so we feel like we can better do our job. We do have the experience. Then I understand your position and you know the chips fall where they may, but that's not what you said. You told me you guys don't have a preference and you don't think you have the authority because why would you need the extra language if you already had that authority? So that's where I'm confused, Director Moore, is the transparency piece. Mm -hmm. And now on the back end of 56, we're having extensive discussions about what was meant, what wasn't meant, more eyes reviewing it. But these were the words I, in working with you and reaching out to you, rely on. And so what am I missing? Uh, Chairman yeah. Flitner, uh, Co-Chairman Ellis, you know, I don't think anybody's missing anything. I think in, in that discussion, and I don't have the email, I, I recall it um, very well. Um, but I think, I think what we've got here is a situation to where we felt like at the time, if you don't want us to touch it and you just want us to rubber stamp the lab reports, say so. I think that's, that was, you know, maybe we didn't make it very clear that that was it. But at this point, it looks like that in, in, um, in a recent court case, um, Judge Simpson said that we do have that final, we are responsible to make that final choice. And, and, and so I, I understand your confusion and, and your concern with that. I don't think it's an about face um, because if, if it had been crystal clear, I guess, um, that we don't have that option, okay, so be it. So just a follow up, Madam Chair, and, and I'm aware of um, Judge Simpson's order. Mm -hmm. I think the difficulty with that was they, this issue wasn't litigated and there hadn't been all this extensive legislative history that's developed since that time. You'll recall that when 56 was introduced, you had that additional language as determined by the commission based on the commission's findings. Mm -hmm. And we've taken that out. And I think that the fact scenario has changed significantly because of those extensive discussions. So I know there's a need and a desire to rely on Judge Simpson's analysis, but this issue wasn't presented to him. And I think that that's my concern going forward is, we, I thought made it very clear in our conversations about what the expectations were. So, um, you know, Madam Chair, I think that this is just kind of, I think the highlighting the struggle that we're gonna have when we set a grandfather date. Um, you know, we'll look at historic horse racing machines, 1,265 compared to 836 skill machines, um, the horse racing numbers will grow or historic horse racing machine numbers can grow, but the, the skills can't, that, they're stuck at 836 unless we take action. So, um, and I think that if we didn't create that grandfathering in, then you can, as an applicant say, okay, maybe we're not gonna do these machines. We're gonna try a different vendor or a different manufacturer, but we didn't do that. And so that's why these denied applicants, it's such a critical conversation that we get it right. And I'll be very frank in that explaining that you know, the, the reasons and the rationale only became clear and aware to me once these cases were litigated. There was nothing in your commission record, your denials letters that explain the rationale. And so going forward, that's my concern too, is no matter how we tinker with these definitions, are we, is the commission just gonna keep moving the goalpost and making its own definitions and making its own rules? So that's the assurance I'm trying to get after is we put plain language on a piece of paper and define what skill is. We set up an entire regulatory structure that doesn't just rely on the definition of, is it a game of chance or skill? That analysis was from 2018 when we didn't have any framework at all for these machines. Since that time, we've added lots of controls. Automatic denials if you have criminal background in your record. Limit of four machines per establishment. 21 year olds only, age restricted area. So it's not just an analysis of the machine, it's all these other controls. And so that's again, another piece of why I'm just, confused on your fixation with the lab reports. It's one piece of a much larger comprehensive framework. Um, and so, you know, along those lines, I, I wanted to just respond. I have heard some concerns about the age restricted areas. Um, can you tell me how the commission's monitoring that so that those age restricted areas in whatever establishments where they're permitted are being actually kind of monitored by the establishment owners? Director Moore? Yeah. Mr. Lair yeah, Laramendi. I pass it on to okay. Special Agent Lair Laramendi. Thank you, Madam Chair, Senator Ellis. So the agents are constantly going into. Oh, 
Oh, I'm sorry. You are. There we go. So the agents are constantly checking these locations and all of the locations, we found several that it's very questionable about, is this really an age restricted area? In those locations, we've reached out to the operators or to the vendors of those locations, trying to work with them to bring them into compliance in those locations. So it's tough with 306 locations and up until about two weeks ago, there was two of us to hit all of those locations, but we do keep a running record of those. And when we get complaints on those, we go to those locations. We have reports on all those, including correspondence with the vendors to, to try to rectify those. And then when we do find those and we reach out to the vendors, you know, we give them a deadline of like, look, this is what we're seeing. This doesn't fit the definition of a, you know, a 21 restricted area. You need to make this right within so much time and we're going to go back and we're going to check. So that's, that's kind of how we're approaching it right now, trying to bring those ones that are questionable into compliance. Thank you. And uh, President Davis, welcome. And uh, we appreciate your presence here. And if you don't mind, first of all, thank you for your service on the commission. We appreciate that. And if you have any comments, you're welcome. The only comment I have is that we're doing the best we can do, the best management practices at this time, you know. So I'm sure there's going to be some errors and some ups and downs, but I believe that the commission itself has done an outstanding job as commissioners to get this going and to the situation in place it is right now. It's a pretty tremendous task. So my hat is off to our staff there for what they have done. Thank you. And if, if you don't mind, what is your background and your expertise? <laughs> Just I'm curious because this is definitely not my bailiwick. So please tell us. Representative, um, I have a quite an extensive background and it's mostly in business. I uh, started my life as a plumber. Then I got 35 years in, in the oil and gas industry. And then we've had a ranch for 25, 30 years now. And we're also into the hotel, motel and restaurant. So in a small community, we uh, are highly involved. And uh, I'm in a lot of different committees and under a lot of different uh, gatherings. So it, it's, that's kind of my background. <laughs> An overachiever. Uh, well, my wife doesn't think so sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Co-Chair. Yes, madam. Um, just to follow up to that, um, would you share with us, you're an avid horseman, um, a fan, so just a Senator little bit about Ellis. what your knowledge is with horses and uh, fondness for horse racing. Yes, Senator Ellis, I do have a racing stock and we do have a stud at the ranch and we have several mares and we've been in the racing business oh, probably for 15 years, and licensed in several different states and have had horses running in several different states. and. Uh, so that's exciting too. And I believe that's probably why I was, my name was thrown out there to be on the Paramutual Commission at that time was because of the background. And uh, with the extents of my business knowledge and everything else, I think I'm pretty well-rounded in a lot of areas, <laughs> especially around here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, follow up. Yeah, M Madam Coacher, just a question about the cannibalization and the number of machines that are out there. Um, have you, maybe the, this is something for the commission to provide as well, is some kind of an analysis of what your numbers have looked like in prior years. And then we can see, you know, if when skills came online, if that dented your revenue streams, but it, it does seem like this bizarre thing we've set up where, you know, we can add new historic horse racing machines to offset some of that, but the, the skill is kind of limited to that, again, that snapshot. So if you have that, but if you, um, direct, or excuse me, President Davis want to share any kind of your perceptions of if it's had an impact on um, life horse racing and historic horse racing machine revenue. President Davis. Okay, I guess I missed some of that question. Could you? Yeah, Mr. Chair, or uh, Madam Co-Chair, um, have you noticed uh, a negative impact on revenue derived from historic horse racing machines because of skilled machines coming online? Uh, that's, uh, Senator Ellis, that's been a question that we've talked, what is the peak? How many dollars are out there? You know, um, I, every every meeting, it seems like we keep getting higher and higher spikes. And uh, the OTBs seem to uh, 
be looking at the public and seeing what the public wants. You know, that's why you're seeing like the peer imports over here, the, the grander, more elegant facilities for the OTBs. Uh, the games of skill, I, what Charlie had alluded to is there's many people that sat out there <clears throat> because the games of skill were deemed illegal that did not have them in their establishments. And as he alluded to, those establishments now would like to see those games of skill come in now that they're deemed legal because there was the question of could you lose your liquor license? You know, how does your community handle it? How does your county handle it? You know, with the paramutual, the counties have, have the ability to deny any paramutual rate OTBs in their in their counties, you know, and they're they're working through that. Carbon County just recently through the commission, commissioners did pass and allow uh, paramutual wagering back into Carbon County again, but it was gone there for a while. Um, I would like to see personally, would like to see these games of skill generating revenue for the state of Wyoming, but the avenue is not clear. It has to, how to get them back out there and get the expansion going. I think there is a demand. Um, I'm just not sure how we can do that right now. Well, we can do it with changed legislation if the time, if that time comes. So I have Senator Grew and I also have Vice Chairman Newsom, and then it's 938. We need time for um, public comment as well. So when we have a 10 a.m. hard break. So Senator Grew. I will go quickly, Madam. All right. Thank you. Question for is it Chairman Davis or President Davis? I I uh, other committee. I'm trying to make sure I title correctly. It's Senator, it's just Bob. Okay. <laughs> Bob. Um, we've talked this morning about a lot of different subjects. We've talked about, you know, the skill games, historic horse racing, and, you know, and then what's on the schedule is talking about now these, you know, sports wagering. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is, is this is growing exponentially and, and it's growing. The dollar's getting bigger. And we've talked about the board and we've talked about some of the, questions that have arisen about how, how decision-making gets done and rules get promulgated and all that. My question is for you as a member of the board, um, do you, is there something you feel that we could be doing um, legislatively or through, the, through the, the commission itself to get more information, more training for the board? I mean, Look, we're a citizen legislature, so I'm, I, I'm not saying that you should all be professionals in gaming at, you know, at, at, at a high level. But at the same time, we have a lot of, we have the LSO, we have a lot of resources at our disposal to get in, informed on issues. Do you feel you and your board are getting that information? And if not, what would it be? How could we help? How could we provide it from your experience on the board? President Davis. Yeah. Representative Flitner, uh, Senator, um, I believe the commission itself is really getting that type of information out. There's a lot of internal memos going out between the, the staff and the commissioners, educating them on that. In the past, before the COVID, <clears throat> excuse me, we had attended many seminars in different states on different, different things if the, if the commissioners wanted to. And uh, Charlie has brought forth a lot of uh, people like from RCI, <clears throat> excuse me, on the new national legislation that's coming down for the paramutual and the horse racing and stuff like that. So I think we're getting as much information as we can, but just like you and just like us, we uh, rely on, on, on educating yourself as you're going, you know, in a diverse background, as I'm sure all you guys have, um, I didn't wasn't that diverse in the ranching business when I started. The oldest gambling, legalized gambling in the state of Wyoming, but you know all these things. It, the commission is composed of a lot of really um, seem like very very good thinkers, you know, and and they're educating themselves as long along as we're going through this process. So I think 
we're all getting up to speed. And uh, I, I think there's gonna be a, a, in my opinion, these rules that we've come out with are second to none. You know, if you've read any publications nationally, I mean, there, Wyoming is being quoted as doing this sports wagering correctly, you know, so let's just not muddle it up and, and mess it up. You know, we'd like as a commission to hit a home run for the state of Wyoming. And that's our goal. You know, that's why we, we may look like we muddle through these meetings and things like that. And, but I really believe that there's a lot of, a lot of participation from, from the commissioners as self. You know, is that answer what, what you're looking for? Okay. Thank you. And Director Moore, do you have a follow-up? Yes, uh, Chairman Flitner, Senator. We have a training, training program that we've been putting together, you know, not unlike athletics or anything else, schedules that are coming. Um, we're doing some webinars that will be recorded. We're doing, um, you know, we had hoped to do it last week. We got tied up. Do it probably this next week, a Q&A um, with some of the sports wagering vendors and kind of preloaded questions, um, so to speak, and, and take 45 minutes to an hour, sports wagering 101 kind of situation. We're also reaching out to the national organizations, um, basically discussing exactly what you're looking, you're talking about. How do we get, get everybody up to speed to this in a quick manner? One of the things that came out many years ago when a commissioner was, was coming on board and he's from here in, in Laramie County, um, we, about two weeks into his, his term as a commissioner, he said, holy cow, um, this is, I thought I'd have a learning curve. I didn't know the curve was straight up and down. Um, and, you know, one of the hardest things is finding people for these boards and these commissions. And, and you understand that. Um, you know, several years ago, it, it wasn't much of a problem. But now it's like, okay, who's our first choice? But we need to have first, second, third, and fourth choice in these areas. So, you know, to, to speak to, to what we talked about earlier, if we can kind of maybe, you know, boards and commissions, sometimes our geographical errors, which is our best friend um, in a lot of ways can be our enemy. And, uh, you know, we need to be more flexible in these appointments and things maybe to where we can get people um, from different areas and that flexibility, so. Thank you. And I believe Vice Chairman Newsom's question has been answered. So we appreciate your time, all of you today. And um, Mary Beth, do we have anybody virtually from the executive branch that would like to testify? Madam Chair, I only have um, Mr. Spoonhunter available, um, and I think he wanted to comment after, after the commission's testimony. Okay, all right. At this point, we'll open public comment. So thank you all very much. I appreciate that. So if anybody would like to speak to this topic item, um, online sports wagering, you're welcome at this time to address the committee. Nobody in the room. So does anybody know a joke? All right, Mr. Spoonhunter, I see that you have raised your hand. Would you like to address the committee? Oh, I'm sorry, Madam excuse Paul me, Chairman, Mr. Chairman. Butner, yes, please. Please, okay, Councilman, can you, please go ahead. Okay, you guys can all hear me, hear me, right? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you, Madam uh, Co-Chair Flitner and Madam Co-Chair Ellis and members of the committee. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Lee Spoonhunter and I have the honor of serving as co-chairman of the Northern Apple Business Council this term. I would like to thank the members of this committee for allowing me to provide comments on behalf of Northern Apple Tribe. I will, I will be brief in my remarks. First, I wanna thank Director Moore and the entire Wyoming Gaming Commission for their diligent efforts and hard work. The Northern Apple Tribe knows the strong value, value, the value of strong regulations and how important they are for the gaming industry. The tribe's length, lengthy experience of gaming has shown us that strong regulation results in positive gaming experience for the consumer. The tribe also recognizes that its current engagement and partnership with the state has generated many positive outcomes and would like to continue to grow this partnership in the future. We thank the governor's office and the legislator 
for the opportunity to work on gaming and other topics of interest between our governments. Uh, as was stated earlier, with the increase of scale games, the, the tribal casino numbers have decreased. An expanded tribal state relationship benefits the citizens of Wyoming and could help to ensure gaming dollars remain within the state. The tribe hopes to have the opportunity to continue to engage with the state legislator and the Wyoming Gaming Commission in the future over the possibility of further tribal involvement with the state, of ga with the state gaming system. In particular, we appreciate the commission, including the Northern Rapo in the stakeholders meeting on the proposed sports betting regulations and hope to continue to work with the legislator moving forward. Again, on behalf of Northern Rapo Business Council, we appreciate and recognize the work and efforts of the legislator and the gaming commission. And at this time, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chairman Spoonhunter. We appreciate your time. Uh, committee, questions for the chairman? No, I, we do have questions. Hold on, Chairman. Mm -hmm. Senator Guru. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chairman Spoonhunter, you talked about the tribe's experience, and I know it's extensive. I, I just had a question. You don't, in the in your gaming establishments, you don't have um, sports wagering now, do you? Or and if not, do you anticipate having it? Chairman Spoonhunter. Madam Co-Chair and, and Senator, yes, we are currently working on sports betting uh, through the National Indian Gaming. And also with our casino, we, we are going to have a sports book right in the Wind River Hotel and Casino. And so we are working diligently, again, like you all, to uh, make sure that we have everything in place before we're up and operational. Thank you. Thank you. Senator, did you have a question? That was your question. You guys are thinking alike. Madam Co-Chair? Yes. Madam Co-Chair. Madam Co-Chair, um, Chairman Spoonhunter, just to be clear, sports betting under the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act is considered a class three um, activity, if I'm not mistaken, because we don't have a compact, the state of Wyoming with the Northern Arapaho tribe. What is that process for you um, to bring sports betting online? Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam, uh, Madam Co-Chair Flinner and um, Coach, uh, Madam Co-Chair Ellis. So we are able to work through the secretarial procedures that uh, were granted to us, as you all know, we don't have a compact with the state. We're kind of very unique in that aspect. And so we are working through our secretarial procedures to ensure that um, we are compliant and also that um, we do this, that we protect the consumer and uh, on the casino on sports betting. I hope that answers your question. Just a, a follow up, Madam mm -hmm. Chair. Just again, for the committee's understanding, I think if you looked at the draft rules, the commission, the Gaming Commission of Wyoming has made it clear um, that they don't have the authority to um, offer sports betting on the res reservation. So there's a car there's carve out language on there. Um, and so just wanna make sure I understand this correctly. When, if your tribe goes down this path of offering sports betting, it's only confined to the bounds of the reservation. Is that correct? Mr. Chairman. Yes, it's within the exterior boundary of the reservation. That is correct, Madam Chair. And then Madam Chair, just to follow up, um, have you been in touch with the commission about those exact boundaries? Because um, I know geolocating is you know, pretty precise. From what I've heard, if you take a step into our neighboring state to the south, it knows where you are. Um, but I think we need to get that right. I know that there's um, always ongoing concern about what those exact reservation boundaries are. So just wondering if you've had the chance to visit with the commission about that. Mr. Chairman. Madam Chair um, and uh, Senator Ellis. Uh, so we are working on that right now. Our national, you know, as you know, we have a gaming agency, a commission of our, of our own here on the reservation and they are working with the, uh, with the rules of the National Indian Gaming so that we outline that. And, uh, you know, we look forward to working with all of you also. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And please do stay in touch with this committee and we'd like to hear how things are progressing with you. Further questions for the chairman? Thank you very much for taking the time to address the committee. Have a good day. Thank, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. You all have a good day also. Thank you. Um, Director Moore, I do have a question for you with regard to the geolocation. Um, is that, that is specific software. So does the state of Wyoming have to have its own geolocation software? If you could just please elaborate on that. 
I'm not sure I, Chairman Flitner, I'm not sure. Could you repeat your question, please? About the geolocation mm -hmm. software. Do we have, does the state have to have that software in place or do your vendors that provide the, the sports betting, do they have that in place? I, I'm completely ignorant yeah. about sports betting, betting. So if you could elaborate on that. Well, six months ago, Chairman Flitner, six months ago, I was too. So, you know, um, the vendors, they provide that. They provide the geolocation service. And currently, um, the primary vendor that's in the United States right now is doing about 95%, 98% of the US, Northern Amer North America. Um, so it's, it's a service that is provided um, on multiple, multiple states that they utilize. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. Many further questions for Director Moore? All right, well, we thank you for your time. We are ahead of schedule, so uh, we'll take a, a break and we'll come back. Madam, Do you guys want to come back in at 1010? Madam, Madam Chairman. Yes, Representative Sweeney. Um, so is there nobody in the audience as far as public comment? I noticed nobody got up. Um, I did have, um, from the industry perspective, I wondered if there was anything this committee should be acting on on um, uh, the online uh, sports wagering um, if they feel the process is going well or not well but um, I guess they don't want to testify so no I don't oh did you please come forward if you want to address the committee my apologies if I missed you earlier you're fine. Just if, see the microphone. If you push that button and make sure the light turns green. And then uh, we're just normal folk, just like you. So just take a okay. deep breath and introduce yourself. Okay. Um, my name is Allie Bohannon. Um, and we had skills game prior to the legislation that went through last March. Um, and I just wanted to, <clears throat> excuse me, elaborate a little bit on what Senator Ellis was saying. Um, we were one of the initial five groups that was rejected because the company Next Level Cyber Sales that supplies our games um, didn't have a Wyoming addendum in their skills game lab report. So when the new bill was passed, we were so excited. Um, we, our vendor has received the paperwork, um, but is closely following another vendor who has submitted their paperwork and now what we're hearing is there's great hesitation on the part of our vendor to submit his paperwork based on what they're hearing um, with the skills game lab report that's being reviewed um, that has the it's our understanding that it has the skills game um, has met the skills game requirement has the Wyoming addendum and is now gone into a legal process to get it through um, so just from a small business standpoint, we're a little frustrated at the, the process because now we're, ha we have to stay with the vendor we're at is our understanding based on the legislation that was passed. And we're um, having trouble with our vendor because they don't, they're not interested in a legal battle per se. Um, so I just wanted to make you aware that there is a small group of us out there that are watching what's happening really closely with this um, skills game because we'd love to get back up and going. Um, you know, we employed a lot of people. It helped our other small businesses for sure. Um, so we're just um, looking for some clarification on um, the lab reports and what exactly is the, the process here. So I think that's it. Thank you. Chairman Ellis, did you? This. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. You know, this is, I think, a, a source of contention between, you know, certainly how we, when I worked on Senate File 56 and adding some of that language versus how the agency's interpreting it. So I wish I could give you an answer. You know, our when I read the language in the plain language, it says, as long as an uh, applicant meets these criteria, the commission shall issue a license. And it is, do you have a lab report indicating that your games meet the criteria? Check. Right. Is it only four per establishment? Check. That's how, when I worked on that language and communicated that with the commission. So where we are beyond that, um, I think we're trying to sort through some of those issues. Okay. Senator Guru. See, he's just like yeah, you. He can't yeah, get yeah. the button on. Uh, there you go. Hi. Hi. <laughs> 
Uh, so you purchased these machines? So we had uh, machines from a vendor okay. called Next Level Cyber Sales. They were not our machines. We were just the establishment they were in. Okay, so they were their machines in your establishment? Yes. Okay, so you didn't have to purchase them. No. But the, do, you have a, do you have a contractual arrangement with them to keep those machines there? Um, so right now the machines are back in their possession because we didn't have the skills game certificate. We removed them from the state yeah. per the legislation. Um, but because all of our paperwork was in by the March deadline, we have the opportunity to have our application relooked at. Okay. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Senator Landon. Uh, thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Uh, just uh, to pick up on where my good friend from Teton County was. I'm just trying to understand what you've run into because okay. obviously we're concerned anytime that it uh, affects our constituents. Uh, so, so really what came down was that these machines uh, in some way did not measure up. Can you explain to us what, what that verdict was? So again, um, I'm sorry, I'm catching up here. Uh, the supplier of our machines um, is next level cyber sales and they have all of their paperwork together to send to the gaming commission. But what we're hearing now is there's great hesitation on their port on their part to submit that paperwork um, because of another business in the skills game community. I don't believe it's a large group of vendors, um, but they have submitted their paperwork. They had the skills game um, laboratory report with the Wyoming addendum in it to meet our requirements and they're still um, they have had to move to the next step and get an attorney and etc and our vendor does not want to do that they don't want to fight a legal battle with the gaming commission so um, we're just having a hard time as a small business figuring out what the next step for us is um, if our vendor is watching this other case so closely Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, just to follow up to that, so what is it that locks you in with the vendor that that you're currently with? I believe the way the law is written, you have to reapply the way you applied the first way. So the first way we applied was Next Level Cyber Sales supplied the games to our establishment for us to run. And I believe you have to apply with the same applications you put in. So our us as an establishment, we can't even submit anything to the gaming commission until our vendor is approved, if that makes sense. Man, it, it kind of does. I, I really appreciate you being here today. Thank you for catching us up to speed here. Representative Sweeney, and, and it's 10, so quickly. Okay, thank you. thank you, Madam Chairman. So thanks for your testimony. I think part of the problem is uh, the way in which the House um, uh, interpreted the, the new uh, regulations on the skill, skill games, um, it grandfathered those operators that were in place in those machines and locations. And if, if in this case, the vendor um, applied late, didn't have all their paperwork together, uh, this, the machines weren't license, licensable. Um, it blocks anybody further, another vendor from the legislation blocks uh, another vendor going to her location um, because of the grandfathering rule, which I would like us to visit um, at possible language clarifying and defi defining um, where to help businesses just like this um, uh, in this case. And I don't want to use uh, the wrong words, but I think we can further clarify that uh, would be, be my goal. Um, Good point. Good point. Senator Salazar. Thank you. We appreciate your testimony and I'm sure we can, we'll get this figured out. So thanks for coming up and speaking to this committee. That. Thank you. You bet. All right, committee, it's 10.01. We'll take a break. We'll come back in at 10.10.
All right, the committee will come back to order. We do not have a quorum. I'm gonna send my vice chairman out to serve as sergeant in arms to bring back the committee. So if the good directors would just be patient. Sandy will get them in here. Yeah, she's our marshal. She's our she's been appointed sergeant in arms. Sergeant in arms, that's right. Oh. All right. Hello, General Director. You were like Superman yesterday. You were in your Superman costume and then you came back as Clark Kent. Yeah, luckily there was a place in here that I could quickly change. <laughs> Do you have a telephone booth somewhere? In yeah, a telephone booth <laughs> and a secret place in the basement. <laughs> well, you should have stayed in your uniform and you didn't have to change. So thank you for your service. You bet. Thank All you. right, we are back. Uh, and uh, before we, um, our next agenda item, item is with the Wyoming Game and Fish. But before we do that, the committee just uh, would like to take a moment to speak to uh, the last issue that was just brought up. And uh, so, Senator Landon, we had kind of a sidebar uh, during our break. So if you would like to address the committee. Uh, Madam Co-Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciated the discussion this morning uh, all the way across the board on gaming. And I, I would say up front that I think we've asked a lot out of that uh, small agency. Really appreciate uh, those volunteers who serve on that commission um, and, and they've done a heck of a lift. That said, um, the testimony that we received at the very end really um, uh, hit home for me. And the fact is that as, as we go through these growing pains and we try to get our arms around this skill-based uh, gaming industry, we've had some of our small businesses just caught in the mix. I would like to make a motion that we uh, encourage our co-chairman to draft a letter on behalf of the TRW committee uh, to the gaming commission to rectify some of these situations that seem to be mired uh, in the mud and going to litigation. Uh, it feels like to me that the gaming commission would have the ability to get this resolved for these small businesses. If that doesn't happen, we can certainly roll back in as a committee in February and fix it ourselves. But uh, Madam Chairman, that's my motion is that that letter be drafted on behalf of the TRW committee to encourage strongly that the commission um, get some of these things resolved. Okay, Second. Madam, second. It, okay, it's been moved by Senator Landon and seconded by Senator Salazar that the committee draft a letter uh, directing the Gaming Commission to resolve uh, some of the issues that we've heard uh, that were addressed to the committee this morning and specifically to the last person who provided testimony to the committee. Uh, committee, do you have any comments? Representative Sweeney? Thank you, Madam Chairman. So um, I didn't hear all the discussion, I, I apologize. Um, and didn't realize that she was actually, I thought she was from uh, Cheyenne. So, uh, but uh, same situation where we've got, um, she can't be grandfathered because of the operator. She did have machines. So technically, I believe the commission can, um, uh, look at another vendor, but it brings up a number of clarifying questions in my mind. So can they never upgrade their machines, even though they're totally legal, unless we have a statutory change? Um, and can they never say they have an operator they don't like? that won't come service the machines, they're stuck, which makes no sense to me that an, another operator, licensed legal operator, um, but we've really, either we or the commission, I don't know which, I've, I've never really thought about it that way. 
So I'm not blame, putting any uh, disrespect to the commission, um, but um, we've, we've got to think outside the box on this one. So uh, perhaps um, if there is clarifying legislation, um, I think there is uh, some clarifying legislation that maybe we should look at, um, which uh, Representative Walters had an amendment uh, but it didn't didn't move through the house um, that probably will take care of this and uh, well we have a motion on the floor to have a letter drafted uh, senator salazar thank you madam chair I, I think it's also important that we have a time frame um i would like to hear back the resolution of that letter rather than an ambiguous ongoing letter that perhaps um we don't get finality to so um Dependent on uh, Senator Landon's approval, and obviously the chair, I, I, I would, I, I wouldn't mind hearing um, in person uh, at our August meeting some type of where we're going with this um, uh, to help us guide uh, the future. So, okay. Chairman Ellis, thank you, Madam Chair, on and for the motion. Um, you know, I've taken a particular interest in this because um, my constituents were affected. They were one of the denied applicants. And they didn't get a reason of why their games were denied only until they filed a, a lawsuit. And so they're out the cost of their litigation to try and get their games up and running. And it just seems like this never ending goalpost that we're trying to achieve. Um, you know, we have a definition that we said, here's what a skill based amusement game is here are all these other controls, you know, make us feel comfortable with having the presence of these machines in our state. But it's like, well, we're going to change the definition. Now we're going to do our own analysis. And here's the criteria. I mean, these are all after the fact. And that's what bothers me is if you're a private business and this last year was tough we heard testimony um, as we worked on senate file 56 that these machines really helped our bars and restaurants stay afloat during widespread closures as supplemental income and so the denied vendors and the denied operators you know missed out on that year that could have maybe helped their businesses survive a little bit more strongly so that's i just want to be clear that's my interest in this is um we're elected to represent our constituents and my constituent was directly affected by this and if we don't speak up for small business owners and the little guy who have to hire their own attorneys compared to our agencies that can rely on the resources of our attorney general's office, I just feel like we've done a disservice to our citizens. So um, on and for the motion and then um, happy to keep entertaining ideas. But when it comes to legislation, I think we have created the situation where if when we have these machines grandfathered in, what is the end game? I mean, in 50 years, all of those operators will be dead and then the games will be gone. I mean, so we need to probably have a, a more thoughtful approach on what that means for our state long-term rather than just saying, well, we, we got it done, Senate file 56, now we're, we're gonna wash our hands of it. So, um, and just along those lines, I think competition is a good thing. Um, I think we can rely on our free market and allow customers to have options where they wanna go and use these games or not use these games. Um, we're all grown adults. So thank you, Ms. Madam Chair. Yes, Senator Landon, follow up. Uh, thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Just a final word. I'm sensing some support for the motion. I just, uh, I think that, I think the, hopefully the tenor of the letter would be to encourage uh, the Gaming Commission to do all that they can to resolve some of these issues and um, bring back to us uh, by August what they've done to fix it. And, um, if they run into some situations where they simply can't resolve, then we need to know what those are. And, and at that point, I think we can draft legislation or whatever it takes, uh, Madam Chairman. So um, I think this is a good starting point to say, let's, let's push some envelope here and get our small businesses taken care of. So okay. thank you. Very well. Yes, Representative Knapp. Madam Chair, thank you. Um, on and for the motion, um, I do have some sympathy with the commission. I think that they're catching up with policy. Um, I think policy was clarified with uh, Senate File 56 and input was asked for and given. And so it is, it is law. Um, however, I know in the house we had pushback on, for instance, skills games expanding. We, we had the truck stop um, expansion that, that failed. I think it's it's important that the body is clear on our intent of what is gambling, what is it for, what do we want it for, what's its purpose, and how limited it will be. Um, 
some recommended that it follow the liquor licenses um, for limitation. But we need to we need to clarify that because otherwise we'll be taking two steps forward all the time and one step back. And that commission has to catch up with our decisions. And so I think that's that's one thing that we need to to look forward in in doing. So thank you. All right. So you've heard the motion. All those in favor, uh, vote by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion pass, passes. So Chairman Ellis and I will get together and we will draft that letter and uh, we will do that. And then we will uh, see if we can have a resolution by August. Madam Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, if I could just add some clarity to uh, mm -hmm. Representative Sweeney's inquiry in regard to changes to perhaps software or hardware. Wyoming well, statute 1125.302 was amended or created, um, but the original language included a new provision whereby if a uh, operator is going to change their hardware or their software in a the game, they're required to submit or could be required to submit a new lab report. Um, so I think it's fair to infer that um, you know all operators are allowed to change their games. And if you're changing hardware, I would assume that could be through a different vendor. Um, so I think the legislation, it can be argued, does contemplate um, the changes to businesses that would always occur regardless of the business, but I just wanted to provide that context in the statute. Thank you, Mr. Brody. I appreciate that. Representative Sweeney. Thank you, Madam Chairman. So to that end, would that also contemplate um, a different operator being available to put games if there was a non-qualified vendor? Um, uh, would it, would you be able to take a new vendor and put in uh, their machines that are qualified and licensed uh, into the spot that wasn't, in, Mr. Brody? in your opinion? Uh, Madam Chairman, you know, unfortunately <laughs> with, with the law there, it's, it's always, you can always argue about it. And I don't think the statute, you know, statutes by their nature are not going to contemplate every in and out of what can occur on the ground. Um, so what I would say is that the statute is not clear, does not pro provide that direction. Um, and, you know, as, as kind of a basic tenet of administrative law, it's up to the agencies to, to fill the gaps, so to speak. So really, um, and people can disagree with what the agency does. So that's not the solution necessarily all the time either, but we, we defer to let the administrative branch to fill those gaps in legislation to kind of answer these nuances that come up uh, through the legislation that's passed. That's the best answer I can provide. Okay, thank you. Just a follow up, Ms. Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. I think the difficulty we've seen though is because of the rush nature of how House Bill 171 came on board in 2020, they didn't have time to write rules. And so a lot of this is, you know, they're an unknown, like what, how they're going to fill in the gaps. I mean, I think when House Bill 171 passed in 2020, it was temporary. So I understood that the commission was hesitant to start a whole bunch of rulemaking, not knowing the certainty or permanency of our intention. And so that, again, is due to our, how we structured that bill. And so I, I think, you know, these things will get sorted out, but a lot of this needs to be clarified through rules and not just, and that's my biggest concern is the inconsistency. Um, you know, if we're going to start picking apart lab reports, well, let's develop some criteria. When, first of all, let's authorize it as a legislature if we want to do that. Second of all, then do rulemaking. But I think that's why when I read the act again and again, and I have, I think recognizing that we had that time crunch of trying to get our arms around how many machines were in the state, we didn't build in time for them to do that rulemaking, which is why I think we asked them to rely on the report. So we do have a lot of things to sort through. Um, but we're not doing ourselves any favor by um, thinking that we've got it all fixed. There clearly are issues that are hurting our constituents. All right, let's get back on track. Thanks committee, appreciate it. And thank you, Senator Landon and Director Nesbik and Director Miyamoto. We appreciate you being here today. And uh, so the floor is yours. All right, good morning, Madam Chairman, members of the committee, Brian Nesvik, Director of the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. I am joined here today by Director of the Wyoming Department of Agriculture, Doug Miyamoto. Got a few members of my team here that'll be with me throughout the day here through all of the various topics we've got uh, throughout the end of the day. So I've got my Deputy Director, Angie Bruce, back here in the corner. 
um, our chief of fisheries, Alan Osterland, and our public information officer, Sarah Dorenzo. And then all of you saw Chief King yesterday. He is going to be here today, but he is appearing by video. I um, told him he needed to be in Casper because his son uh, qualified for state track and he needs to be there for that. So he will be here to, uh, to testify though on the, on the agenda items that are pertinent to his, his uh, wheelhouse. So I wanted to start this morning by just giving you an update on the um, zebra mussel response group and kind of where we're at today with, um, with a, a, an issue that you're certainly all familiar with. And I really appreciate and respect the fact that you took a couple hours um, towards the tail end of the session to um, hold a public hearing and to receive information on this um, zebra mussel, uh, discovery of zebra mussels in our state. Um, to, I, I won't review all the background unless there are specific questions um, in the interest of not repeating things that you're already all well aware of. But if you recall, when we last talked, um, the governor had just directed um, Director Miyamoto and I to lead a group, uh, a zebra, mus zebra muscle response group to um, quickly identify some objectives and figure out how the state would, uh, would proceed and deal with um, this discovery in, with, within the borders of our state. And so we're gonna go through that today, Doug and I will, um, and talk about what the group has done um, but before we go there and talk about specific um, objectives, I would um, yield the floor to, to Director Miyamoto if he's got anything to add on background. Thank you, Director Miyamoto. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Good day again, Doug Miyamoto, Department of Agriculture. This, uh, this has been a very enlightening process for, for us at the Department of Ag. Uh, as I stated to you during the session, agriculture stands to lose a lot if uh, zebra mussels become established in the state of Wyoming. And I just wanna iterate my appreciation for the Game and Fish Department for bringing it to our attention and helping us work through what it is that we might be able to do as an agency to help with this situation. So I'm looking forward to kind of going over with the committee today, the thought process that we've had over the past couple of months, the things that we've learned and the, the steps that we put in place to hopefully contend with this if we do discover this uh, muscle and live water situations in the state. So thank you again for having me and appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Madam Chair, um, just as a, a reminder, so the, the folks that were represented on this um, response task force um, was the Director Miyamoto and I, as well as DEQ, um, the Wyoming Water Development Commission, State Engineer's Office, Wyoming Energy Authority, Office of Homeland Security, um, State Parks, YDOT and then the Office of Tourism. And so leaders from those organizations came together. And the first thing we did is, is quickly identified the primary objectives that, um, that we would focus on and, and attempt to achieve in order to deal with this, um, this crisis in our state. Those five objectives, and we'll talk through where we're at with each one of those, were eliminate the source, investigate, find and assess any potential impacts, contain and eradicate, and then also throughout the entire process, communicate. And with that, I think we'll start with eliminating the source and I'll ask Director Miyamoto to uh, start there. Okay, thank you again, Madam Chair. Um, eliminating the source, uh, I got a call from Director Nesvik uh, very soon after they had discovered that these zebra mussels were contained in these Marimo balls, these moss balls that mostly are used for, for fish aquariums. This was not a pathway that we had ever considered. It would always been the assumption on the, on the behalf of it, the agriculture industry and on behalf of recreation and sport fishing that it would likely come in the form of bilges within boats or some kind of agriculture irrigation type of infrastructure that would come in that had never been completely dried out. Might come in in the form of industrial water moving equipment, water truck, something along those lines. But this was one that took me by surprise. The ramifications remain the same. So we began immediately investigating what, it, what regulatory uh, infrastructure we might have in place to deal with this. And what I landed on was nursery stock law. And so typically if you have non-native invasive species or typically plant species that would come in the form of, usually it comes attached to ornamental plants, you know, for nurseries that you might see different plants that are sold at 
general stores, you know, Lowe's, Home Depot, Walmart, that type of thing. We have inspectors that go through a lot of that nursery stock and they're looking for invasive species there. And if they find them, there are things that we can do to prevent the sale and spread of those, of those species. So that's, that's what immediately jumped to mind, but this is a little bit different. We weren't sure if uh, moss balls qualified as nursery stock. And so we did some analysis with the attorney general's office and took a look, really close look at our statutes and our regulations and determined that uh, these, these moss balls do photosynthesize and for all intents and purposes with respect to the, their relationship to this invasive species that we did have enough authority to go ahead and issue a quarantine order. And we did that on March 9th. So what that does is ban the importation sale and and transfer of, of these products. We send information out to all of our inspectors out along the state that typically do go into places like feed stores. Well, oftentimes that's, uh, that's coordinated with pet supplies that are available and let them all know what was going on and to be on the lookout for that and, and immediately started calling the vendors that we could identify. And we sent hard mail to everybody that was on our list about uh, what to be on the lookout for and, and that this quarantine order had been in place. State of Wyoming acted very quickly and in relative terms to other states. Most of the other states are, are, were behind us in terms of how fast we responded. And I have to give credit to the Game and Fish Department who uh, made that a priority for all of us very quickly. And it, and it was something that we were able to do fast and I'm glad that we were able to. So far, we don't have any indication that we've identified zebra mussels in connection with other, with other nursery stock type products in the state. And we've been looking for those as well. We can issue quarantine orders for other plant species if we discover that we have a new host. We haven't done that to this point in time, but that's what we've done to eliminate the current source. And there's a lot of activity going on on the national level uh, at the ports of entry and actions that have been taken by, I believe it's Fish and Wildlife Service to uh, help out with this effort. All of the states are now aware of these brands of moss balls and uh, at the federal level, APHIS and Fish and Wildlife Service are also aware nobody is left in the dark. Most states have taken some form of regulatory action. Most of that mirrors what we've done here in Wyoming. So I believe we have a solid set of regulatory hurdles in place to prevent the transfer of what we know so far about zebra mussels and their pathways into, into our state. We'll have to remain vigilant to prevent future importation of, of these mussels, however. So Director Miyamoto, then if I did a search on Amazon right now, I wouldn't be able to find moss balls for sale on Amazon or one of those online sites. Madam Chair, the, the online, I would like to be able to answer no, you wouldn't be able to. The online, the online retailers for this have been the most challenging aspect for, for us as regulatory entities. We've contacted those that, that we were aware of and we do searches for this brand and this species of, of moss balls to try to ensure that anytime we run against or can find those for sale, we can contact those vendors and, and let them know about the quarantine order. I believe it's mostly been addressed. And I believe for the most part, you would have difficulty buying that brand, that species of moss ball, but there isn't any way to be able to know for sure. And we do know that there is some black market sales of, of these moss balls in, in kind of response to these quarantine orders. Fascinating. Additionally, Madam Chair, I would say that there are synthetic moss balls. And so this product still is available, but the um, specifically the product that had zebra mussels in it, you know, the both federally and at the state level, there's been a lot of effort to identify the source of importation and stop it. And um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Department of Ag both have done a good job with that. There's they identified that 90% of these products came into the United States through two ports in California and, um, and then a couple ports out in the, the other 10% on the East Coast. They have the um, initiated inspections on all those ports for these particular products. If a importer is found to have a zebra mussel or a quagga mussel, um, they're 
they have to turn around and, and export it back out at their cost. And so there's quite an incentive on their part not to bring these things into the United States. Um, so far to our knowledge, um, that's been successful. We did also learn from their efforts about a, a handheld eDNA reader um, that they're using that provides a test result within 40 to 50 minutes. And so we are securing those in Wyoming. Um, they're expensive. The test strips are 100 bucks a piece. Um, but, but anyway, that, that, those efforts are underway to be able to quickly, um, number one, stop um, these things from coming. But then as we move into kind of the next steps, um, be able to detect any zebra mussels that do show up in our water infrastructure. Okay, thank you. Please proceed. So the second objective, as I said, was, was to investigate. Certainly there are um, criminal violations as well as some potential civil liabilities that come with the importation of this kind of a destructive species. Um, we initiated and, and worked with the um, US Fish and Wildlife Service to do a joint investigation, both into state and federal violations. That investigation continues today. Um, and there's really not a lot more to report on that other than to say that the investigators, both in the state of Wyoming and federally, have um, achieved what they believe is the is sufficient evidence collection efforts. They've, they've achieved hundreds of samples from all over the country. We're well over 30 states that found these products in their state. And so um, that, that investigation continues and it, it'll probably take quite some time before um, they make any decisions on um, if there will be any charges or if there were any violations of federal or state law. Um, the next thing that we really focused on was, was going out and looking now at um, finding and assessing the potential impacts to our state. And so um, as we talked through that, one of the things that was already going on that was quite helpful was that the, a lot of the municipal water facilities across the state were already collecting um, samples for COVID. And so we were able to um, secure a portion of those samples. Our lab, our Game and Fish lab was able to develop the proper assays and, and the other technology that they needed to be able to do the tests in our lab. And so that, that's been going on already um, with testing municipal water facilities. Testing live water um, is a little bit different situation um, because it's typically, we're not able to successfully um, do very good testing until the water warms up. And so we've, we've actually been doing testing for a decade now in live water around the state. We will continue those efforts and we've identified places where we need to go look more. Um, we also had, as we, as we looked at this, assessing the impacts, we asked all of the, the different entities that were represented on this response team to investigate their own particular area of responsibility. So we had you know, state parks looked at what the potential impacts could be there and how they might be able to help with um, assessing any um, and finding these things if they show up. We had um, state engineer's office and, and water development both um, assess this. Department of Ag looked at um, agricultural water delivery systems and how they can be tested and, and put into place plans and communications out to irrigation districts across the state. We also had the Energy Authority talk and, and look through potential impacts to power generation facilities. Um, most of the information they provided was is that because the water, once it comes in, is self-contained, that they believe that there was a minimal um, risk to those facilities, and but but anyway, they were made aware and they looked at their processes and procedures to make sure that they had um, they had some some processes in place that would help detect these things if they did show up. Uh, I'm happy to report that we haven't found any um, zebra mussels outside of these products. I say that with um, with caution though, because we know that the larval form of of these things is microscopic; you can't see it. And for them to develop into adults sometimes takes up to a year. And that's when you can actually see them. And so if some of these things did make it into either a um, into water development or water infrastructure or into live water, it could take quite some time to be able to, to detect them. The impacts, I think we talked about that quite a bit when we updated you um, the last time, but really anything that touches water could potentially be impacted by these if they were able to be viable 
and survive in whatever environment they found themselves in. We don't have any information to believe that they can't survive in, in a, like in a sewer system. We don't, you know, because we've never had them in Wyoming, we really don't know for sure if they would be viable in live water in Wyoming. We, we think they would based on what they've done in other states, but we don't know that since we've never had them. We do know that in Montana, they did detect them in um, Canyon Ferry Reservoir, very large reservoir. And then after a couple of years, they were no longer able to detect them. So there have been, that is one scenario where I know of where they showed up at, at least to this date have never become viable. So anyway, we worked through that. And, and I think um, we, everybody involved um, determined ways that they will be on the lookout for and do the appropriate testing um, to quickly identify them if they do show up in any of those kind of facilities or any of that kind of infrastructure. Um, anything else on impacts, Doug? Thank you, Brian. Madam Chair, I think, um, you know, the, the one thing that I would stress about, about impacts is, again, agriculture stands to lose quite a bit. And we, have, we know that we have over 7,000 different points of diversion live water that support irrigation processes around, around the state of Wyoming. We have a harder time getting a handle on how much irrigation infrastructure exists past those main points of diversion. Those are all privately owned. Some of those are part of irrigation districts and ditch companies, but by and large, uh, we don't have a good accounting of how many miles of pipeline there are, how much gated pipe is out there, line canals, these type of uh, water diversion structures. I know that the Water Development Commission is working on that. And I've spoken with Director Gebhardt about that. And, and I believe that he's on, he's on tap to talk to you a little bit about the efforts that they've got underway in terms of inventory. But I think from the Department of Agriculture's standpoint, the critical piece here is going to be early detection and rapid response. That's, that's common for all management of invasive species. But particularly here, the sooner we get to it and the more quickly we can respond to it, our, our uh, efforts go down exponentially compared to what happens once they become universally established throughout a lot of different static water, water bodies or live water in the state. And so that's what we've been focusing on. We knew coming in that the Game and Fish Department had already developed something along the lines of 23 different rapid response plans if they were to detect these type of villagers in, in, in reservoirs in Wyoming. And so we also knew that that would be important for the Department of Ag to do for all of our customers, people that use irrigation water. And so we've developed a, a rapid response plan as well. And what basically that revolves around is, is getting as much information out to our producers about what to look for how to identify these things, how to monitor for establishment within your irrigation infrastructure, and then get as much information out to, out to our producers as we can about different strategies that I, they can undertake to mitigate you know, the, the formation of these, of these muscles within their pipelines and within their irrigation structures. So it's an information campaign uh, for us at this point in time, but that's what we've done to try to respond as quickly as we can. And we've also used all of the agencies that are, that are serving on part of this team to develop a, a report that is really designed to be a pull out chapter by chapter accounting of what we've done here and all of the steps that we've taken so that you could look at each agency that might be impacted and, and be able to look at the strategy that they've undertaken and, and they can use this as a living document to modify the strategy as, as time goes forward. And so that's kind of where we are in assessing our impacts and, and we would be very interested to be able to get more information about privately held irrigation infrastructure and be able to get an idea of the quantities that we're talking about. And I don't have a good estimate today and that has become painfully apparent through this process. It's been hard for us to be able to build estimates of what it might take if you don't know how much of it is out there. So, thanks. Thank you, Director Miyamoto. And I'm, and I'm, you'll be addressing the Ag Committee, I'm sure on this issue, or I know it's not on there. I don't think it's on there, a, a topic um, 
interim topics list, but. Madam Chair, as part of my agency update, I, this is something that we've been working on pretty pretty aggressively, and so it would, it'll be part of my agency update. Okay, and if there's anything we can do, I mean, I know because that's my world, and I know that those ditch and canal boards often only meet a couple of times a year, and if they're independent, um, getting the information to those smaller uh, ditch and canal boards, I think is critical, and so if there's anything we can do as legislators to help with that, please let us know. Thank you, Madam Thank Chair, you. and I do know that we have reached out to all of them that we have records on the water development office, the state engineer's office and us have sent information out to, to all, everybody that's on the list anyway. Okay, Dr. Nesbitt. So Madam Chair, you know, the basically the strategy and, and we've kind of covered this a little bit, but the strategy if we detect them was to contain and potentially eradicate depending on what type of a structure that they were found in. So we know based on the experiences in other states that eradication once they find themselves in a large reservoir is not it's just not an option. It's not a reasonable option. It's been attempted in many states and it's never been successful. Really the only thing that kills these things is being dry or treating them with high temperature, 120, 140 degree um, water that has some chemicals in it. That's how we decontaminate boats as an example. Um, but you, you, know, you can't apply those techniques to a large body of water. And so our strategy in these rapid response plans has been to identify what steps, steps we would take if it was detected to contain it to that particular body of water. And these plans are, they've been, we've actually been working on them for two years. We're, we're finally to the point of, of publishing those, but they're very thorough, very in-depth and very expensive. And, um, and that's, that's a topic that we'll talk about next is, is how we might pay for this if we had to implement any of these. Um, you know, when you talk about municipal water, the concern there is, is that if once, once water enters a water treatment facility, there probably is an opportunity initially to contain it, but most of them have some type of effluent. And a lot of that effluent is into live water. And so they are working now on looking at ways they could either kill it while it was there or contain it um, to their particular facility. Um, we don't have final answers on that. We don't know exactly if, if they've developed a way to do that yet. They're still working on that analysis and you know, talking to other states and figuring out how other entities and you know, specifically municipalities around the country have dealt with it. Um, so that, that work continues. Um, and the last thing I wanted to touch on is just the communications effort. One of the things that I am reasonably confident about is that most folks in our state know about this. I mean, it, very quickly into this effort, um, our team um, put together and worked with other agencies. Um, I've got my public information officer here today, Sarah Dorenzo, because she... Um, took a real strong leadership role in that team. And, and, um, and, and they really did a lot of creative and innovative things to work beyond our typical list of stakeholders, you know, people beyond just hunters and fishermen. A lot of aquarium owners don't, uh, don't routinely engage with the game and fish. And so they did a, an awesome job of getting the word out um, across the entire state, multiple radio spots, TV spots, social media, um, they initiated a, a moss ball voluntary take back program where people could take their moss balls into a regional office and get entered into a drawing to win, um, win some cash. And so um, the list is lengthy of all of the different things that are um, that we've done to communicate. But suffice it to say, I, I do feel comfortable that we've, we've reached a, a significant portion of the state. Communication has not stopped. You know, it's part of my talking points in front of every group I talk to, um, and our communications team con continues to work hard on that and make sure that we're getting the word out. So, Director Nesvik, on that volunteer, um, um, what was the effort of our citizens? How much of a response did you get from people bringing those in? Yeah, we, we had basically um, a lot of folks had already gotten the word and had already destroyed their, their stuff. But we did have, um, you know, it was it was a handful. I think it was a, it was less than a hundred moss balls that were brought into regional offices, and and we disposed of those. Of course, we tested them, and um, but but it was uh, it, it actually there was as much about that that was communication mm -hmm. as it was actually receiving large numbers of moss balls. So um, I was I thought that was a really good effort, and I thought it was good too that we had several folks that said, you know, I would have brought mine in, but. I saw your stuff and I went and did what you told us to do and we got rid of them, so. That's terrific. I think the, the, what, the campaign that you guys, uh, you know, just the fact that you'd seized on this and 
all of your agency partners, you guys jumped on this, I think is, is huge. And I, kudos to all of you for what you've done and helped to mitigate what could have been a serious disaster. And I know it's not past. I know we still have to be mindful and watchful, but thank you for all your efforts, everybody today. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I, I have the same message. I really thank folks that got involved. I mean, Chairman Ellis was on the phone with some of our friends and in, in uh, big companies around the country trying to say, hey, what can you do about this? Don't don't sell any more of this stuff. And and we had a lot of efforts like that from folks that heard about this and knew it was a big deal for Wyoming and really helped. It was a, truly a Wyoming effort. That's great. All right, carry on. So with that, that that's really um, what we wanted to update you on today. Uh, Director Mimo talked about the, the report that um, is near completion. All the agencies contributed to that. He did a really good job of putting together a method to bring a whole lot of information together into something that can be digested. And so that report will be available for folks to use in, you know, in case this happens again when, when none of us are um, sitting in the positions that we're sitting in. And um, I would just conclude by asking Director Miyamoto if there's anything, uh, anything more on this. No, I don't have much to add, Madam Chair. I would just say that, you know, for prevention of, of future importation, I think if we can get past this scare with it being maintained as a scare, it will be one of the more healthy scares that we've had. I know that it shook my agency into a, a level of recognition and an action that we hadn't considered for zebra mussels to this point. I don't think you can really plan for this until you've had to experience it. But I think we're a lot more vigilant now. And so hopefully this will be maintained as a scare and an exercise for us to, to really be prepared if we do have to deal with another aggressive invasive species going forward. So to this point in time, if it's not in live water and doesn't impact our irrigators, then it will have been beneficial for us. And hopefully we can maintain it as such. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Committee, uh, Representative Hunt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Director Nesbitt, I wasn't uh, able to attend the briefing that you guys put together during the session, but once these things are in a waterway, is that, can you just kiss it goodbye, even if it's a large, I mean, where there's one, there's more. So even if it's a large body of water, if you were to find mussels in, uh, you know, Pathfinder or Flaming Gorge or something, if they're in one location, is it safely assumed that they are everywhere or at least eventually will be and that there's not a whole lot that can be done to stop that? Director. Madam Chair, Representative Hunt, um, that's correct to an extent. So if you take though a, a body of water like Pathfinder that has many downstream reservoirs in the Platte River that runs completely through our state, it's safe to assume that it, we could potentially slow the spread, but it would probably move down the water system over time. The Flaming Gorge is a little different. I mean, certainly, you know, downstream would become another state's problem. But what our response, one of the primary actions of our response plans um, is that, you know, every boat then, we, we would have to control very tightly access points into those reservoirs. And then every boat that left would have to be decontaminated so that you didn't spread it that way and, and potentially didn't spread it cross drainage into another another system, but you know, one of the worst scares is, is you, you end up with it in Seminole and then every downstream reservoir from clear out to the to Nebraska is potentially infected with zebra mussels by the time you're done, said and done. That would take a significant amount of time, but it, it, we, we expect that that's what would happen. Follow up? Uh, follow up, um, a little bit different, but have you guys determined how popular are these mothballs as, as you know, sales items. I mean, what, the pet stores and whatnot, um, how, at least up to this, this point, um, how many, what are the sales numbers? How many people, you know, grow these things? <laughs> Madam Chair, um, Representative Hunt. So we know they had at least over the last year become very, very popular. Um, the pet stores told us that, you know, they, they sold hundreds of them in our state. We don't, have a way to quantify that number, um, but we know they were very popular. They're not very expensive. And um, the other thing, I mean, because they're popular, we've heard, we haven't been able to find evidence. We've looked, but we've heard about this underground market for these things. Um, 
we heard about this from other states and um, but we're continuing to watch that don't have a good gauge for you know how they're continuing to be traded um, and sold on the black market um, but that's how popular they are that they that there's at least some folks that believe it they're being sold that way senator Schuler. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, just a couple quick questions. One of them I thought about your incentive program I thought was really great and you guys did a super job of getting the word out quick. Um, but what I wondered about would uh, John Q. Citizen be able to detect one of these things that they had them in their you know, aquarium? I don't know how big they are, what they look like. I mean, I think the, the people in Wyoming would be really, if they knew what they look like and how to detect them, I think they'd be really great about making sure that they got the word out to you. But that was my first question and the second one, is uh, I wondered when you talked about the municipalities, do they not have quite a bit, or at least quite a few of them have the infrared capabilities to kill some of these kinds of things in their water systems? So two questions. <laughs> Come on down, he's calling in a lifeline, so. <laughs> so I, I, I think I can answer the first question. Okay, go ahead, um, Director Nesbitt. Madam Chair, uh, Senator Schuler. So the, um, you know, the, um, we, we've sent out a lot of material that shows a picture of what these things look like in their adult form. They're still very small. And so, and, and we know that people have been looking at this, our, the products we've sent out. So, you know, people that are you know, really into aquariums and stuff, we hope that they've taken a chance to look at what one of these things will look like. And there are other muscles that look pretty similar to a untrained eye. Um, so the hope is, is that, yeah, we, and, and we'll continue to message that this is what they look like. Um, as far as the treatment and infrared, um, I know that Alan will do a much better job than I of, of talking about that. Please uh, introduce yourself for the record, sir. Um, Madam Chair, um, I'm Alan Osterlin, uh, Chief of Fisheries for the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. Um, Senator Schuler, to uh, answer your question, I've learned a lot about wastewater system treatments since uh, March 3rd. Uh, I don't know everything, but one thing that I have learned is some of the larger treatment centers like uh, here in Cheyenne or Casper, uh, per se, they use UV light to treat the water coming in and sometimes a combination of chlorine too. But one thing that, uh, you know, there's DEQ standards as far as the outflow, the fluent that comes out of there. And those standards try to address uh, protection of invertebrate and vertebrate life as it goes out into the system. So um, as the director Nesbitt said, you know, we, we can't rely on other states because this vector hasn't been in other states yet. You know, it's been more, the transfer has been through watercraft. So um, it, it's, it's new ground for us. And uh, so we're gonna really intensely sample to see if uh, um, they are um, getting into the water treatment centers. There is a, a chemical earth sac that they use in water treatment centers for municipal water um, around the country that has been effective. But again, using it in those facilities, I don't, I don't know if that would be applicable. Committee, further questions? Yes, Representative Sweeney and then Representative Banks. Thank, thank you, Madam Chairman. So. Uh, you mentioned about the, the pet stores, and I, I think those have come in different varieties, but the national chains in particular, um, did they rep reply positively, and were they willing to help? Director Miyamoto. Thank you, Madam Chair, Representative. Yes, by and large, we, we contacted as many outlets as we could identify, have them for sale, and the larger ones, I think Petco might have been the original play, the original uh, franchise where we identified it, or the Game and Fish did in, in Wyoming, and they did, we have had overwhelmingly positive response from, from the owners of the, of the outlets to this point in time, and haven't, ha haven't had to deal with very much resistance to, to this point. I think people realize that you know, this isn't something that you would intentionally propagate. And I might add too, Madam Chair, so national chains, Walmart, Etsy, um, all the Amazon, all the large um, online uh, merchants, they were cooperative. 
and, and the Fish and Wildlife Service did a lot of that work at the and Department of Ag at the federal level, but I, I haven't heard of any pushback. I mean, they all seemed like they wanted to, to help and realized it was a problem. Okay, follow up? Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. So um, the last, last thing I've got is, I remember, I believe Chairman uh, Plitner had brought, I think it was $100,000 um, uh, trying to fund, find some funding. I don't believe we were able to get that through, unfortunately. So is, is there something as uh, this joint committee uh, that we can help uh, the executive branch on, on funding or something that this committee could do? Madam Chair, Representative Sweeney. So there's really two efforts here as I see it. And I'm gonna, this next topic, I'm gonna spend talking about really the future. Um, as far as the effort that we just undertook, you know, to this point, um, we believe, and we've discussed this with the governor, the expenses um, can probably be covered in the, the uh, governor's office contingency fund. You know, they weren't in the millions. And so that's the, the route that we're pursuing right now um, to take care of the effort that we just went through the, the near term issue. And so, you know, the thing that anybody that's on a probes in here, I know one Senator that's over in the left side, left of me here, um, you know, that could continue to support funding for um, the governor's office contingency. I think that is effective for these smaller scale, lower cost kind of efforts like we just undertook. Representative Banks. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just a quick question. You have those four tiers of testing that you have in the in the presentation. Will those tests continue beyond the scare, like in perpetuity now that there is sort of that scare going forward? Madam Chair, Representative Banks, um, absolutely. I guess I don't want to say perpetuity because I hope that at some point we can kill these things and not worry about it anymore. But, um, but yes, we are continuing that in our efforts that we've been engaged in in Livewater for over a decade will continue. And we've identified places where you know, we'll upscale those those efforts where we think we need to based on where we know these moss balls are being sold. Director Nesbig, how much has your agency spent to date on this issue? You have an idea? I don't off the top of my head. We do track um, our tracking the man hours to our um, reporting system. So we could get that number. Okay, but that'd it's be been great. fairly significant. Thank you. Further questions before we move on to, okay, Director Nesbitt, carry on. Do you wanna proceed with uh, talking about funding and or have you spoken to the governor's office about dollar amounts and please? Uh, absolutely, Madam Chair. Okay. If that's the pleasure of the committee, I'd be glad to, I'm gonna, I'm gonna follow Chairman Ellis's lead from yesterday and I'm gonna just throw out an idea and let you guys all take shots at it and anybody else who wants to, so. I like that. It's like going on, yes. on the wall. And, and I have talked with, with several of you folks about this individually, but you know, the, as we develop these rapid response plans, and now I'm gonna really focus on, um, on you know, my wheelhouse and these things showing up in live water in a, in a reservoir or a stream or, or a river. And, and as we develop these plans, many of them, you know, are look, we're looking at costs of one to $2 million a year, maybe even more in the initial, in the initial year. And, and that's significant. And I've, I've, as I've told many of you, you know, I feel like this is an issue that affects all people in Wyoming that use water. And so, you know, I feel strongly that it's, it should not, uh, the expense for this should not be borne on the back of just watercraft users or just hunters and fishermen, and that it really should be borne by um, all of our citizens. And so, you know, this is, this is the idea that I've, I've um, talked with several of you about and that I think is a place to start. And that is that, you know, I, because it's contingent and because we don't have an issue to deal with today, you know, I don't, I don't think there's a need to transfer money to the game and fish. But what I do think would be helpful is if there was some sort of an, an insurance policy so that if um, tomorrow we detect zebra mussels or quagga mussels in Flaming Gorge Reservoir that the governor has the ability to um, take money from some account, some coffee can somewhere and apply it to the response. And, and like I said, those costs, 
you know, the best estimate I can give is, is it's probably in the first year, $2 million to deal with this as soon as we find them. Um, it could be less in smaller reservoirs. But, but if there was an existing account where we didn't have to move any money from um, something like LISRA, something like the water development account, uh, other funds that I'm not, not aware of, that in statute, you know, the governor had some discretion to go into that account in an emergency situation and, and pull funds, um, you know, obviously with a limit to apply um, to the response. I think that's something that certainly would give us a level of predictability. Um, it would give our citizens some level of comfort that we're ready um, to quickly respond because as, as Director Miyamoto pointed out, I think the immediate and quick response is very important. And so, you know, in a nutshell, that's, that, that's the idea I throw at the committee for, for some discussion. And I do know that we've got state engineer here, I think um, water development commissions online and, um, and certainly I'd um, offer any of their thoughts on this as well. There's Brandon. I'm muted. Mr. Gephardt, thank you for joining the committee. If you'd like to uh, offer some comments at this time, they're welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Brandon Gephardt, Director of Water Development. Uh, this is um, this conversation is is very similar to one that we had a couple of years ago uh, with my agency and addressing aging irrigation infrastructure. A uh, result of that was an emergency account established under water development account. Um, and, the, and the intent of the emergency account is really to put boots on the ground and to address an emergency when it occurs until, and then that would act as a stopgap until traditional funding or some other funding could be identified to, to address the emergency. Uh, what we're talking about right now is I think very similar to the concept of the irrigation infrastructure account um, and one suggestion maybe to consider or throw out there would be to establish a similar type of emergency account. Uh, and in this particular case, it might be most prudent to have it under uh, the game and fish. Um, but it would establish an account, that money would sit there, uh, rules would be made to, to focus the efforts into this effort of uh, invasive species. Um, and I think our emergency account could be, and I believe there are other instances of contingency accounts throughout the state that, that could also be uh, an example of how that could be set up. But to allow the commission, the game and fish to uh, have that account and to access it quickly uh, would I think be beneficial to addressing these issues when they arise. Okay, thank you. Committee questions for Mr. Gephardt? Okay, we appreciate you being here today. Thank you. For the questions, committee? Representative Jennings. Thank you, Madam Chairman. So I have a question for the Director Nesbitt, actually two, depending on the first answer. Okay. Uh, if I could, Madam Chairman. So Director, um, what, what did the, I really appreciate what you guys have all done in this potential crisis. I think it's been very good. Um, what did we receive from Pittman Roberts? Did, did they pay that once a year, every other year? Um, and this final payment or this last payment? Madam Chair, Representative Jenkins. So on an annual basis, currently, we receive about $18 million a year in, and it's a reimbursement or a match to costs that we, so we basically, anything we do that, qualifies as match for those Pittman Robertson funds, either time or expenditure. You know, we submit that and then they reimburse us a couple of years later. Right now it's about um, 20 to 25% of our annual budget. Follow up. Thank you, Mr. Madam Chairman. So, so last year was a, a very good year for Pittman Roberts, a lot of, lot of uh, gun sales and things of that nature. Is that not something that this would fit into that we could uh, set up some sort of a uh, fund that if you had to react to, you could out of that, and then Pittman Roberts would match out of that. Director, uh, Madam Chair, um, Representative Jenkins, Jennings, I'm sorry. Um, 
the some of these expenses would qualify for Pittman Robertson. Um, we, we have had um, over this past year, there has been an increase in firearms and ammunition sales. We won't actually see that revenue increase for a couple of years. It usually takes that long to work through the federal system. But even before that, you're the, you know, Pittman Robertson has done quite well for the states over the last several years um, because of those sales. It would only apply to um, those things that are directly related to wildlife management. So it have to be, it couldn't, it couldn't relate at all to municipal water. It couldn't relate to um, things that weren't um, directly affecting the um, wildlife management. And that those Pittman Robertson funds are very specific to that. Um, the other thing I would say is, is that, you know, I'm, the idea I picture is, is, is long-term and um, Pittman Robertson sales, while we don't see anything in the near future, um, you know, with them decreasing, um, they do fluctuate over time. And, and then the last thing I would say to that is, is again, that, you know, certainly there's an interest for the people who are paying those excise taxes um, that, that result and are consequential in Pittman Robertson. There's an interest in those, for those folks in dealing with the wildlife management challenges, but, you know, other impacts, other water impacts, you know, at least from my perspective in representing um, sportsmen around the state, you know, there should be some, my perspective, there should be some um, responsibility to, to other water users as well, not just hunters and fishermen. Do you have a follow-up, Representative Jennings? Sure, Madam Chairman. So would it, would it not be possible though to kind of separate that out? Because it, like you said, this would hurt everybody. So the water people maybe could pony into this $2 million fund or whatever, but a, certainly a part of it could be out of the sportsmen because this will affect sportsmen also. Um, so could that not be part of that, part of that equation? Madam Chair, Representative mm -hmm. uh, Jennings, ab absolutely, the answer is yes. And just jumping on that mindset, I, I think though, if you're talking about how this particular invasive came into the state, potentially could have come into the state, it was through a, from a pet shop sale. So, I mean, you're looking at every citizen in Wyoming having to pony up to some degree to try to keep this um, mitigated and keep, keep it from being disastrous. Senator Guru. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Another thought, because um, just taking off on what you just said, and it would be just a massive statewide problem. And actually, we were just talking over here on offline about you know, it's always been kind of a nagging thing in the last couple of years that it's just, you know, boaters. And you know, when you buy a boat fee, you're paying, you know, extra fees for this. But if there is money needed, um, the legislature in its infinite wisdom did actually do something about it. We passed a House Bill 150, which is now enrolled Act 74, which starting July 1st has, gives the governor a $10 million fund coming out of Lizra just for this type of emergency. And um, it's, uh, it's all laid out and each $100,000 spend point, he has to inform the legislature and form appropriate committees. But that was what those of us that worked on this bill um that this is the type of thing that was that was contemplated a fire flood you know a breakdown of a large water canal or those types of things that were just you know so we don't have to do the big flex authority or just you know all the machinations of moving money around from department to department that we have to unravel later but that money too might be away committee further comments or questions and I know that we have the governor's office in the room and I'm sure they have uh, been kicking this around as well. So um, thank you all, don't go away because we may have further questions and Director Gephardt, I'm assuming you'll stay with us. Thank you. And uh, so Mr. Butt, if you'd like to come up and address the committee, please do. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman, Joe Budd from the Governor's Office. I think the directors have covered it well. Um, all of our agencies really came together on this one and, and did an excellent job, but the Governor's Office has stayed engaged um, and, and the funding question going forward is really gonna be 
an interesting discussion, I think, because there's at least a half a dozen ways you could do something. Um, so we're happy to work with the committee how we can. Uh, our experts in the agencies are really leading this effort and we're helping where we need to. So. so Joe, is there something this committee needs to do at this point, or do you feel like the governor's office has the authority and, and uh, everything that they need at this point to be nimble if something were to arise? Uh, Madam Chairman, right now we do have that emergency fund that mm -hmm. still has some money in it. There was a portion of that that was cut in the third round of budget cuts. Um, I, right now that'll work. I, I think that the original intent of that account probably was more on the lines of <clears throat> wildfire or flooding or or something really unforeseen, which this was, but um, it may be worth discussion on something that is more tailored to invasive species as a whole or um, something outside of say a, a massive fire or flood event. Okay, well, we'll hope for rain. Madam. Representative Hunt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Going back to these moss poles themselves, and I'm not I'm not suggesting we do this, but I would like a, an honest opinion. Would you, if you could, would you just outlaw the sale of them? Anybody? Director Miyamoto. Madam Chair, Representative, no. I think you know by and large it's it's a uh, it's like other nursery stock. There's certainly some risk with selling selling live products. Uh, this is something that could happen anytime you import something that's native somewhere and is not native here. I think the science has come a long way in helping us be able to assess the safety of those of those products that are coming in. But I don't think we're there. I don't think that, uh, I think it's something that we can manage. We caught this one. Uh, hopefully it won't spawn out of control for us, but I don't think we're, at least in my humble opinion, we're not to that that point where an out and out ban would be in order. Representative Sweeney, did you have a question? Thank you, Madam Chairman. So trying to figure out a funding source um, and appreciate Representative Jennings' thought process. Um, the Wildlife Trust Fund um, and, you know, that work um, is that should it be a combination of different trusts into a separate separate savings point um, because uh, game and fish my recollection is you're not part of the general fund um, so should we look broader um, on that issue, um, you know, via the governor's office and those potential thoughts. Director? Madam Chair, Representative Swinney. So, you know, that's certainly another method. You know, I think that um, when you look at the statute that created the, the Wyoming Wildlife Natural Resource Trust, it's very much a, it's, it's very much the, the tenor of the, of the statute is really not in line with what we're talking about here and responding to an emergency. It's very proactive and it's very much looking at enhancing and improving habitats around the state. And so, you know, my mind really didn't really go towards the trust. Um, and you know what I, one of the things that I think is important as you deliberate this is that, you know, the hope is, is that there never needs to be expenditure out of this account. And that's why my thought was, is that if, you know, money's tight and taking a, a, an allocation and putting it in another savings account that may never get used, you know, that may not be the most responsible or the, the most fiscally responsible way to do this. If you take an existing account though, that's already being used for other things and we're generating interest off of it and just create that insurance policy inside of an existing account. Um, it seems to me like that might be, especially with the times that we're facing in our state right now and all the other challenges that we have, you know, that might be a, I hope the committee will at least discuss that. And director on that thought, and maybe director Lanning can speak to this better, but we've got our water accounts. And so then would, I don't know if there is a statutory change that needs to be made to whereby you could tap into those accounts if you did have an outbreak and you could use some of those funds 
uh, for an emergency such as this, or does that already exist? Brandon. Dr. Gephardt, okay. Yeah, Madam Chair, thank you, Brandon Gephardt again. Um, tapping into water development accounts, I think would probably require some changes uh, to eligibility. Uh, I, I don't know of anything legislatively currently, uh, possibly though. Uh, with, with our funds though, one of the concerns is depending on the magnitude of, of the need and the fluctuation of the available money in our accounts, uh, ensuring that the money would be there uh, would, would probably take some planning on our part. Uh, it would essentially, according to holding a portion of the money and creating that account for this purpose. Um, I, you know, the, I mentioned we do have the, the emergency irrigation infrastructure account. Um, I don't know if it would be the pleasure of the legislature to tap that account for this purpose as well. Um, but that is certainly something that we can discuss. Thank that, you, Director. I, I bring, Madam Chair, I apologize. I bring that up because that, that account is set up as a savings account for a specific purpose. And I, and I think uh, the direction that I'm hearing right now that that would almost need to be the case for something like this to ensure that money is there if it is ever needed. Okay, thank you. Committee, Senator Landon. Thank you, Madam Co-Chairman. I, um, I appreciate everyone uh, and the discussion. Um, and I especially appreciate that this has risen to the level of conversation that it becomes a statewide issue. Not because of why that happened, but I, all along, I've just, I've just not felt right about uh, it all landing on the sportsman. Just didn't make any sense to me. Um, that said, I think our game and fish department has done an amazing job uh, given the, the limited resources. But, but I guess my curiosity is twofold. First of all, uh, maybe to miss, Mr. Gebhardt, how, how much money comes into our water funds each year and how much do we have set aside uh, on that irrigation special fund, those, those two amounts? Director? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, each year into all three of the water development accounts is about roughly $23 million a year. Uh, and in the irrigation infrastructure account, emergency account right now is $5 million and then uh, revenue gaining on interest on that account. Follow up. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I, this is just a, um, a quick thought, but it just, it seems to me like if, if we were to do something as a committee, we might wanna consider um, just allowing the governor to go in and get funds if needed and at first, of course, I thought of the big savings account, the LSRA, but, but really all along, I have felt like the water, to, the water funds needed to be playing a role in this entire area. Um, it, it just seems to me like if we need that quick injection of, of help, it, it could come out of the water funds and we could delay a project or two so that we could mitigate a potential disaster. So. That's just a, an initial thought that I would have. Thank you, Senator. Um, Director Nesvik, if we could uh, speak to the strict, strict liability for users of lakes and reservoirs, that was also another bullet point for this topic. And Absolutely. Madam Chair, if, if I may, I'm gonna ask Chief Osterlund to come up and talk about that. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Mr. Budd. And Madam Chair. Representative so Sweeney. Um, I totally agree on the sportsman issue. The last name uh, of, of Mr. Bud kind of prompted the wildlife trust trust fund um, right. thought. So exactly. thank you. I'm sure they've had that conversation. Go ahead, Director. Uh, Madam Chair, I'll start this just by saying, you know, I, the direction I gave Chief Osterlin was to, um, in my understanding of after our discussion, Chairman Ellis and I's discussion is to, you know, look at existing statutes that might be able to be modified that would um, impose strict liability on a person who imported in, in really a, on a boat or any other conveyance imported these things into the state. And uh, so I'll turn it over to Chief Osterlund. 
Um, <clears throat> Madam Chair, so uh, we did consult with our AG representative um, and she gave us some thoughts. Our, our statutes, um, as far as AIS are not strict liability. And some of the problems that uh, we have with them um, is addressing potential introduction. That'd be one way it would come in if somebody pours out a, 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 a aquarium, um, accidental release, um, or through the ownership of property for per se a watercraft. Um, our current AIS statute addresses 12, uh, approximately 12 different species of, of AIS. And if something falls outside of that, that we didn't anticipate is problematic. Um, so she came up with three potential um, options when combined that uh, she feels would address that. Um, one of them is strict liability, uh, which is, is the term implies uh, no intent. Um, and then uh, I thought it was a very um, creative public nuisance uh, option. So uh, we do have public nuisance um, statutes on the books that could be um, modified within our chapter 23 so that the game of fish would have some enforcement uh, authority, but, and then in public or uh, nuisance per se, which <clears throat> was, um, what she felt was a bigger hammer. So the conduct creating the nuisance is specifically pro prohibited by statute. And, the, and that pro prohibition makes the conduct of any individual a nuisance at all times under any circumstances, regardless of location or surroundings in which it occurs. So if we were to amend Title 23, and uh, fold in the nuisance per se and strict liability language in there that uh, um, would make the act of introduction, whether it be through property um, or incidental through uh, aquarium, uh, a strict liability. Right now, our, our statute reads that um, under 23.4.205, the penalties could be assessed civilly to a reimbursed department for any kind of enforcement investigation, but it shall not include any costs associated with eradication of any aquatic invasive species introduced into waters of the state. So um, if we were to amend, we could uh, um, perhaps put some um, language in there that uh, um, cover the cost for mitigation or restoration of the uh, ecosystem. And under mitigation, that would uh, probably also cover containment uh, under the rapid response plan um, scenario. So those are the, the options that uh, she recommended it would be to um, open up chapter or, or title 23, uh, do amendments to our current AIS statute that would fold uh, the nuisance per se uh, within that um, so that it would give us uh, options of uh, uh, strict liability. And that would be for those species that are listed currently under our uh, statute and regulations. So if there was anything that uh, came in that was outside of that, or a constrictor alligators or something like that, <laughs> um, we would have to do an emergency rule to do that, but that is uh, fairly doable. So. Thank you. Chairman Ellis, do you have any thoughts? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I um, visited with Director Nesvik on the concept of strict liability, and I, I want to be clear with everyone, you know, it's a heavy handed a approach. My thought wasn't to have it apply to any activity that might contaminate a waterway. I think when you talk about strict liability, you really want to get after a behavior where people know better. And so I think if you're a boat user, you know that you need to get your watercraft inspected and permission before you put in. And the concern we discussed was what happens when you have campers that arrive to a waterway late at night and they think, well, we'll just take care of that tomorrow or we won't worry about it. That would create a huge incentive because they know better they should get their permission or make sure that they're not um, potentially 
bringing mussels or things into those waterways. So that was more the concept. You know, I, I certainly don't want to create um, strict liability for someone who is innocently emptying their fish tank because you don't necessarily know that that's, you know, a, a contaminating source. So I just want to be clear along those lines, it's a heavy handed um, remedy. I think it could be effective, but um, I just wanted to, again, we're just in idea phases of how to make sure that we're protecting our waterways. So welcome any committee discussion, but I just want to be clear that was kind of my thinking in, in raising the issue. And director, I, I noticed too, like on the drive down on your on YDOT has uh, employed the use of their signs to get that message out too about any watercraft entering the state being inspected. As a whole, are most people there on board with this coming from uh, other states? They recognize the need to have those inspected. I'm assuming that's also the case in other states. And are, do most people voluntarily participate? Madam Chair, unfortunately, the, we have a significant number of folks that do not stop. Um, some of them, you know, simply don't see the signs. Some of them are traveling through our state and not stopping. You know, that's, that is a lot of the folks that do it. But we, we have folks every year that we go right by those check stations at the ports and, you know, and are later on our waterways without being inspected. I mean, it does happen. So, Director, if somebody did blow by a check and... Uh, for instance, you would discover that they had not been inspected. Uh, if you've had a warden on the water, is there a way to know that somebody has not been inspected? How, do, how does that work? Yeah, Madam Chair, absolutely. So when they get inspected, they're provided a receipt and they have to carry that receipt with them when they're on the water so that if they're checked, um, they can prove that they were inspected before they came into the state. Now, um, every water user in Wyoming doesn't have to get inspected every day. It's only those folks that are coming from outside the state. If, so if I take my boat over to Cabela's to go get serviced and bring it back, I have to get it. Even though I never put it in the water because it's coming from out of state, I have to have it inspected and then I have to carry that. The boat also gets a seal put on it and the seal doesn't break until the boat comes off the trailer. And so there are multiple ways to make sure that, and that's how we enforce it. So when folks don't, they get checked and they didn't get their inspection, then they can be cited for that. How long is the stop? How long does the inspection take? I'll let Alan address that. Um, Madam Chair, um, if it's pretty straightforward um, in a smaller watercraft, it doesn't take very long, minutes. Um, uh, you know, five minutes if they uh, have to do a, a general um, inspection. Say, say the, uh, the person uh, um, indicated they came from Lake Powell, which we know is infested with clog and mussels. Mm -hmm. Then it'll take a little bit longer because we'll do more thorough inspection. And if uh, um, they uh, have been on Lake Powell within um, a certain amount of days where we think that the drying period was not enough to uh, kill the clog and mussels, we'll require de decontamination. And that, that can take up to 20 minutes, half an hour, depending on the size of the boat. And then if you discover someone on the water who has, has uh, who is non-compliant with that inspection, then what, do they, are they fined? Yes, they could be cited. And what is the degree of the fine? Uh, I think it'd be a low misdemeanor, Madam Chair. So like and a parking uh, ticket if I go yeah. to Denver? Just sort of. Yeah, the, it's a low misdemeanor and I don't know the bond amount, but it's up to a thousand dollars and six months in jail. I think yeah. are the max penalties. Bond schedules in the neighborhood of 100, 200 bucks. Yeah. Okay. Committee, further questions? I seem to be Representative Harold's and then Chairman, Chairman Ellis. Thank you, Madam Chairman. So directors, real quick, a question, I guess. So I. Isn't that tag only good for two days on coming into the state? Because I've actually had someone talk to me about this. So when they have it inspected at a port of entry or at a reservoir, if they couldn't catch a port of entry inspection, and then they go in, that, that slip they get is good for uh, 48 hours. Is that correct? Director. Madam Chair, Representative Harrelson. Now, that slip is good um, as long as they don't leave the state now. If they, if they go through another, like an, a check station at Glendo at Gray Rocks, one of those, they still have to stop. But if they've got that receipt, um, and I believe it's actually seven days, correct? 
They just, they pretty much, as long as you haven't been in another water, you just zip through the check station. Excellent. But if you, if you have, if it's been longer than that, then they have to do a new receipt for you. Okay. It takes uh, 30 seconds to a minute. Okay. And, and with, with an exception, and that's sometimes on the busy weekends, they do got to wait in line to get through the, the check station. Yeah. So. I'll follow up. Follow up. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairman. And so, also with that in state watercraft, let's say my boat goes from Gray Rocks to my house, to Gray Rocks to my house, to my Gray Rocks 20 times in one season. Mm -hmm. And I go in there and say, hey, I'm just, I, I, Gray Rocks is the only place that's been, it's dry, it's clean. That's adequate, correct? And I don't have to have a tag because I haven't brought it out or in, in the state. Yeah, Madam Chair, Representative Harrelson, you wouldn't get a tag, uh, a lock for that, um, but periodically you would get a new receipt. Okay. Um, and you have, you know, even if you've got the receipt, even if you just came through the port on I-25 and got inspected, and then you show up at Glendo, when you go by the check station, you still have to stop. You can't mm -hmm. blow by the check station, but it's a very quick process. Okay, I see you just got inspected and you move on. Okay, Chairman Ellis. So thank you, Ms. Madam Chair. Just to follow up on the penalty. So you said a low misdemeanor of $1,000 in six months in jail, is that? I think does, those are the max. How does that work? Because I, I'm guessing they get a paper citation. They don't have to necessarily appear in court. That's if, when does that start kicking in? Madam Chair, so the, Madam Co-Chair, so the, the warden has the discretion um, to either issue a forfeitable citation, which means just like a speeding ticket, they just pay a fine and, and they forfeit their bond. Um, or the warden has the discretion to issue a, a citation where they must appear in court. Typically, there's some kind of an extenuating circumstance where they were either very intentional, they've had multiple previous violations, or um, there was some other extenuating circumstance before the officer would require them to go and appear in court. If they don't go and appear in court, the max penalties or, or any variance between the bond and the max really can't, as you know, can't be applied unless they're sitting before a judge. Most, 95% um, of these are handled with a forfeitable citation. Chief Osterlin, did you have something to add? I was just gonna add, Madam Chair, that uh, uh, Chief King is, is on the line and uh, he, he might be able to oh, fill in the gaps on there. Chief King, welcome. Congratulations on your state tracker. Hope we're not, you're not missing the race. No, it's not till later. Thank you. I, I, I would if, if, if I could, just a moment. Please join us, interject. Uh, so thank you. So uh, just, just to clarify, so on penalties under Title 23 related to AIS, those are, those are uh, high misdemeanors. And we have three of those violations are within the, the bond schedule. So failing to stop at an AIS check station uh, is a $100 bond. That's the amount they'd pay if they just received the citation that's forfeitable, like Director Nesvik mentioned. Uh, failed to purchase the AIS decals, a $450 bond, and failing to launch their boat without inspection is a $450 bond. And um, Given that those are high misdemeanors, if they were to um, be required to appear, then of course the court could uh, sentence them to uh, up to ten thousand dollars in fines, fines, including one year uh, in jail. So I just wanted to clarify that. And we and there are some violations related to AIS, AIS that are fairly common for us. Uh, failing to stop at an AIS check station and failing to purchase a decal are are two of our top 10 violations that our officers deal with each year. So thank you. Thank you, Chief King. Chairman Ellis. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just to follow up, how many citations do you issue each year? Chief King. Uh, uh, Madam Co-Chair, uh, Chairman Ellis, Chairwoman Ellis. So we have, uh, last year we issued 226 or documented 226 violations of people failing to stop at our AIS check station and 135 violations for people uh, who failed to purchase an AIS decal. I, I don't have the breakout between how many of those were handled with warnings or citations, but it's, prob it's probably roughly half were citations, half were warnings. So fairly significant number. 
And Chief King, our state is not unique in requiring uh, watercraft owners to have checks on their boats. I, I'm, I know Montana is just as vigilant as Wyoming. So do uh, the st surrounding states, do they have the same difficulty that we do? Yes, definitely. Uh, our surrounding states all have uh, programs in place to to inspect watercraft and and uh, are are extremely busy with it. Okay, thank you, committee. Further questions for Chief King? Thank you, sir. Which uh, what's the what event is your son? Yes, so he's he's going to run the eight hundred. He's a mid distance kid, and and he's quick to say that he didn't uh, inherit any natural ability from his parents it's all <laughs> <laughs> well congratulations that's exciting tell thank him we you. said good luck thank you well committee further questions for anybody any of our panelists or further discussion anybody have any great ideas on how we can maybe uh, add a little more teeth to this or you know you know from a pr standpoint and i we have um Director Schober in the in the room too. You know, uh, I know that we don't want to. There's a fine line there. I think of, between a heavy hand. You know, we want people to come to the state. We want them to recreate. We want them to enjoy our waters. But we also have to protect our fisheries and our and our waterways and our infrastructure. Uh, so, any thoughts, committee? Madam Co-Chair. Yes. Um, so you know, if we wanted to pursue this idea, and I look to the committee. This is again just for us to discuss and, and move forward. I won't advocate strongly one way or another. I mean, you could structure this to say, you know, if you wanted to have that dangling over, you know, these fines are very significant, $450, that's a, that's a big ticket. Um, but I think, you know, the goal isn't to ding people, it's to get them to comply with the law. So if you wanted to, if we wanted to go down this path, I think you could say something like, you could be strictly held liable if you were issued a citation and it was later found in that waterway. And I don't know the period of time that would need to be kind of sorted. Um, you know, we've got it documented and if we find whatever contaminant, um, you can be strictly liable for up to $25,000 to assist in the cost of remediating, um, you know, the aquatic invasive and, um, or something along those lines. But that would be, I think, if we were to pursue that concept and I haven't given much, con I, I just, heard of your idea of amending title 23 for public nuisance. So I don't know that I've got a thought there, but that would be, I think, somewhat of a concept we could pursue. And I'm sure some people would, would hate that, um, but that is an idea. So Director Nesbick, if you have any thoughts, um, let me know. Yeah, Madam Chair, Madam Co-Chair, you know, it certainly would be a deterrent. It would certainly provide from the legislature some real emphasis on this issue. I think it would speak for the state of Wyoming's um, stance on how seriously we take the fact that we continue to be, at least in our live water, zebra mussel free, quagga mussel free. And so, you know, I, I think we're, we're, um, we're excited about any help that, that the legislature wants to give us to get this message out about how serious it is. I think it's a reasonable way to approach it. Well, and I think too, as a committee, it's also our responsibility to protect our waterways, protect our wildlife. We know that if this uh, were to take hold that it would drastically impact uh, fisheries and uh, we've spoken to a number of species that would be impacted. So bear that in mind too when we consider um, any um, legislation that might provide a little more teeth to uh, game and fish. So thoughts committee? Senator? Madam Chairman, thank you. I, uh, I appreciate the co-chairman's thoughts and I just leaned over to the fellow senator and said, you know, I kind of like the signage, um, you know, that you could be liable for a $25,000 fine if we catch you with these things. Um, I, I think it would be a deterrent. Um, you know, regarding the access to some emergency funding, if we need it, I would just say that it seems like it would be a relatively easy thing to do to add language that we could tap the irrigation fund, the emergency fund under the water accounts that's already set aside for to mitigate disasters on the irrigation front. So that's another thought. Um, I know we're talking about two different things here, but I, 
I, it just seems like that would be a, a place that you could go in and get emergency funding if you needed to. So. Good thoughts. Anyone else? Well, let's think about it. And uh, then if we have any uh, ideas on, and, and again, Director Nesvik, you would require uh, legislative action in order to uh, increase that fine amount. You, you don't have the authority within the commission yourself to do that, right? To make those changes. So Madam Chair, um, first of all, let me apologize to the committee for providing inaccurate information. I'm glad that I had Chief King on there to get me squared away on, it appears based on what Chief King said that I've spent too many years uh, away from being a game warden, but uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, but the bottom line is, is to include the strict liability language with regards to the, the number that the co-chair threw out of 25,000, that would require a statutory change. Um, the fine amounts, the bond amounts within high misdemeanor um, crimes are set by the Wyoming Supreme Court. That's not something that the department has a discretion over. Um, and then those maximum penalties, the $10,000 maximum penalty that's set by, by the legislature okay. by statute. Thank you, sir. Okay, further questions or comments, committee? Oh, yes, public comment. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chairman. Thank you guys for joining us. We appreciate it. Is there anybody in the room or anybody virtually that would like to address the committee? Yes, please come forward as soon as we get an open slot for you. Thank you, directors. Uh, Madam Chair, Co-Chair, I'm Jesse Johnson with the Wyoming Wildlife Federation. I'll try and keep this brief. I wasn't uh, initially considering to comment here because we were sort of in an information gathering stage. We've been in really, really strong support of the Wyoming Game and Fish Department's work on these aquatic invasive species, the response plans, how quickly and what a great plan they've put forth, especially in response to these moss falls. But as I was listening and in the spirit of sort of throwing ideas out there and seeing if anything sticks, um, the, the idea around educating our buyers of aquarium products here uh, perhaps something around labeling, or, you know, I would never say the word sales tax, but maybe an involuntary donation. <laughs> but things that can be put forward that can help draw attention outside of the sporting community. Because I know, you know, we've incorporated into our own communications plan. I know many, many other groups. I uh, think if you look back to the sportsman sign on letter that you were given earlier in the session around the uh, the set aside for the emergency fund in regards to this. All of these groups are, are just talking to their membership, trying to come up with ways of how we can give back. Uh, we were part of the Moss Ball Take Back program as well. We're just trying to find where we can go in, but in expanding that outside of hunters and anglers, because while a large population of Wyoming hunts and fishes, it's not everyone. And so trying to find where we can get that education out. Um, and just reiterating that, that we're here, we're gonna be at this table, we're supportive of it. We'll be trying to find wherever we can funding or things to help uh, get this out, but, but to make sure that we reach outside of the hunting community. And, and I love the idea of uh, liability around, around the boating, but again, we're still just hitting one mechanism of entry um, and, and we need to look broader. So, so in the spirit of being creative, uh, you know, maybe that's where we need to look at and we're here to support whatever's there. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Committee questions? Thank you, we appreciate your thoughts. Appreciate your efforts as well, your, your organization. Please send our thanks. Anybody else? Mary Beth, nobody online? Madam Chair, there's no one online. Okay, God bless you. <laughs> All right, well, committee, if we don't have anything else, we'll, Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, I make the motion to direct LSO to prepare draft legislation um, involving strict liability for watercraft, kind of what I described before, the max amount being 25. I think as a placeholder, some language in there that you've been, you've been cited, um, you, you better hope that nothing shows up in Wyoming's waterways because within, we'll say two weeks for purposes of the discussion today, um, if you were cited, and two weeks later, or a month later, whatever that time frame is, uh, we've discovered an aquatic invasive in our waterway, and that's where you recited that you you could be liable, something to that effect. Um, and certainly, uh, welcome if you want to oppose that concept. I welcome the discussion because I 
I'm just in an idea type phase. Senator Grew. Thank you, Madam Chair. And actually, do not oppose it, would like to see it, but also like maybe let's see it broaden just a little bit about water tanks. Um, you know, the construction industry too has some skin in this game and sometimes unwittingly where they, it's just, they don't know they're working a job and they're filling up a tank and you know, that can be, I mean, as we've seen with the, with the, you know, just stuff in a fish store or in a, in a, in a pet store. Um, it can be take on a lot of different uses. So I would consider maybe broadening it just a bit. If me so further true. comments, Representative Haroldson. Thank you, Madam Chairman. So currently, though, if I hear you correctly, Senator, we we don't require like water tank trucks to go through inspection ports. We don't. I mean, so I, I hear you, but I also we we need a we need a way to actually monitor that before we can we can actually bring recourse to that because right now we can be like yep every water truck they're the ones well we don't know that because we can't test that we have to so i mean I, I love the idea but i think we need to actually have a, a a way to test those or to check those before we we throw them under the bus too so i, I think but i mean going back to what you said i, I do believe that there there needs to be some stiff recourses because we need we need to be careful uh, this is this affects every single person, as you guys have said in this state. If we if we see these come into our waterways, um, sorry, but to clarify, did you say first offense, or is this like if if someone just doesn't care and they just are like, uh, we're going to blow through these? Thank you, Madam Chair. I think this applies to any offense um, because you know there's this the graded scale of offenses. You pay your penalty. That's all contemplated. This would be. Um, you made a mistake and you better hope nothing showed up in our waterway because the ultimate concern is that we have to spend money as a state to address the impact. And so this would be at least a way to have a nexus to say that $25,000 strict liability amount was gonna to go toward that. You're gonna to have to help pay for cleaning up the situation. So that's kind of more the thought process. It's not so much driven by um, any intent because that's the whole concept of strict liability. Okay, it's, a, it's an important part of I think how that works. Okay, and Representative thank you very much, Madam Chairman. So I'm going to play devil's advocate. Um, I've got a kayak in the, on top of my minivan, and my kids go play at the little irrigation reservoir next to the house, and they didn't get it inspected. Now, the single mom with some kids that have a kayak, now they're liable. And so, I mean, I just, I think we need to be careful too, because um, we're creating a great culture of, of understanding of, of the, the need for uh, drying out and cleaning and, and all of those things. But I think we also, I, I don't know, I just want to make sure we don't open it up so much. It just, it just takes and, and runs away with us. But again, representing Her Representative Haroldson, if they never left the state, they wouldn't be liable. I mean, if you were just talking about uh, the mom with a, kayak and she was just going back and forth, right? Thank you, Madam Chairman. But if they came from outside the state in, not realizing the kayak needed that decal, and it's just that it's, it's not just watercraft in the traditional sense of the boat with the trailer, it, it has more to do with. And I understand in, in the state, this doesn't affect near as much as out of the state coming in. But but if you look at the, the watercraft required to have a, a decal, they're kayaks anything over 10 foot uh requires a decal and then there's some inflatable stuff but so i don't know i'm just i'm playing devil's advocate that's, that's all that's what we want director nesbitt did you have some thoughts um just just a couple so i think what i heard chairman l say was this would apply to folks that did not get inspected the decal requirement is completely separate the decal requirement is just like a boat registration i mean it's used the funds when people buy these um stickers is to pay for the program. The decal doesn't mean you've been inspected. So I think what I heard Chairman L say is if you get cited for not having your boat inspected and then there are um, quag or zebra mussels found in, in the water within a certain period of time, then you would be held strictly liable. That's, that's what I heard. And then the other point of clarification is when the legislature originally contemplated this, they did include all of those other conveyances. So a conveyance that has to be inspected um, would include motor vehicles, boats, watercraft, 
raft, vessel, trailer, or any associated equipment or containers, including but not limited to wells, ballast tanks, bilge areas, and water hauling equipment. So it does include those now, and that was that's an existing statute. And it also does, you know, one of the concerns, it does give the commission current statute, the commission the ability to identify um, aquatic invasive species and those that pose a significant threat to the water. So if you use that terminology of aquatic invasive species, when LSO drafts this, there's already a definition in statute that would give the commission some direction on how to, how to approach specifically which species we're talking about. Okay, thank you. So it's been moved by Chairman Ellis, seconded by Senator Landon. Any further questions or comments? Senator, yes. Well, just real quickly, because we can get to a vote here. I. I think one way that we might want to look at this and we can continue the, the uh, debate, you know, at the second meeting, but we don't have any qualms about holding somebody responsible for a fire. Um, I think this is a parallel. I mean, honestly, we're talking that kind of money and that kind of uh, effort that it takes to mitigate whatever disaster. So I think it's a good move for us to at least draft this and then we can continue the conversation at that point. So. Well, and I know, and Director Nesvik, I know, and I heard on the radio in Billings, there's a reservoir that they're uh, they're allowing um, unlimited catch this summer because they're trying to fish it out because they intend to drain it in September because they have found an invasive in that reservoir. And it obviously doesn't probably have any drainages, but uh, that's a case in point. I can't even imagine what the cost might be for the state of Montana for that sort of thing but this is happening now. So you're right, I mean, it's a fire and I think we have to do everything we possibly can to try to uh, help with the mitigation efforts. So with that said, we have a motion on the floor, all those in favor. And Mr. Brody, are you clear on the motion? Uh, Madam Chairman, I believe so. I, I believe the intent for the bill is to impose strict liability on uh, owners of conveyances that fail to adhere to the commission's requirements for inspections and that they will be held strictly liable if a AIS is located in the waterway within the, which they put their boat within X number of weeks and the uh, penalty imposed is $25,000. Chairman, good. Sounds great. Sounds great. All right. All those in favor, vote by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. So we'll have LSO draft that and we'll have it ready for our next meeting. Madam Chair. Yes, ma'am. Madam Chair, before we leave that topic, I, mean, I appreciate the numbers of citations um, that we were received. Um, I think a, another breakout would be, it'd be helpful to know how many of those are out of state violators versus in state. And then um, one other question I had is just on the protocol of how you get after the invasive. So the other thought I had when it came to the mothball situation is, um, we were scrambling, or at least I was, trying to find that nexus with our online retailers. And so I actually reached out to the Department of Revenue and asked for their assistance because they obviously stood up our online retail taxation statute. And so I didn't know if you've had further discussion with Department of Revenue, but is that a mechanism to make sure we've got a tie to large online retailers who continue to sell moth or the moth balls, knowing that we're, you know, we've got all these quarantine orders and, and that kind of thing, but I was just trying to get after that retail, that online retail piece of it. So if you have any information or if you've thought about that a little bit more, that would be another hook of if you're going to be an online retailer offering products in Wyoming, and we've got that threshold level of who, who we know those individuals are. Um, we have like a designated person from those companies to address our quarantines and things like that. So just some thoughts, director. Director Miyamoto, do you want to speak to that? Thank you. I, I would defer to, to Director <laughs> okay. Nesbitt, Madam Chair, but-, but um, They would defer to each other. <laughs> it was a nice try. The way I would respond to that is we did, I, I didn't consider contacting the Department of Revenue. I'll have to go back to the agency and talk with our public information officer to see if he did have the intellect to make that connection. I clearly didn't, but it is something that we'll do now. Essentially, what we did was uh, go online and start start Googling terms by species, moss ball, aquarium supplies, and just 
took a general approach of we're trying to buy these things and we have to figure out where we could potentially get them and just started our network from there and asked around. But no, I did. I never made contact with the Department of Revenue and I think it's a good thought. Great thought. All right, Senator Guru, did you have? Just a comment and just kind of a shout out to the Game and Fish Department, just so the board knows. I know the step we just took, you know, you know, it's a big fine and that's, it's a big deal. But uh, just to let you know, um, I boated a few years ago um, every year on Lake Mead. And then I'd come take my boat up to Grand Teton National Park, Ben Jackson Lake. And of course, Lake Mead does have a muscle problem. But uh, the rules down there were when you pulled your boat out, you had to wash your boat and get it certified by, you know, people who inspected it. And it cost them four or 500 bucks for your boat. And then when you left the, left the lake, you had to stop in and fill out a form. And the, on the form, it was, what would the next body of water you're going to put it in? And I'd say, you know, Grand Teton National Park. Well, that's in Nevada. I wouldn't get to the Utah border before I get a call from my friends at the Game and Fish Department to let me know that they had gotten that information, that they wanted me to stop in at the border and have be inspected, and that they would probably want to quarantine my boat for a month before I put it in Jackson Lake. And that was perfectly fine. After doing that for about three years, I stopped doing it all the way because I just didn't want to be that person. But it's so insidious because if you have a boat that has an inboard outboard motor and it sits for three weeks in a lake um, that has these muscles and it doesn't get right up to temp, you know, got up, you know, run the engines and run them up to 200 degrees plus, and you just pull the boat out and go, those muscles can be all the way in your intakes no amount of, of inspection um, can, can see right. that. Right. And so it, it really is. I mean, it's that, it's that easy to be in violation. This was, this was, I haven't been on that for like nine years. So, I mean, so that's a while back. So they, that's how long they've been working on this. This is to the level they do work on it. And so, you know, they do put a lot of time and effort into it. And uh, for all of us, for all of our, Thank you, Senator. Yourself. That's in, that's interesting. Yes, Director. Do you have any thoughts? <laughs> no, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad that Nevada is proactive. All right. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you for. Um, I feel like we um, maybe need to come back to the the issue of funding again, real quickly. Maybe it's only for me, but I I realize we've got the the ten million dollars set aside. Uh, that was championed by the Appropriations Committee. We all voted for that to give the to give the governor that discretionary money. I regret to say that I think there's a chance that we will use all that money this year. I think other states are coming after us on the Colorado River Compact, and I think that's going to be major. I, I think it's going to be one of the big headlines in the West uh, for the next two or three years. And we don't have adequate amounts of money set aside, I do not think. So with that in mind, I wonder if, uh, do, we, do we pass the baton off to our select committee on water and ask them to include language in there that um, in the case of, of a discovery of, of mussels in our waters, we can access that irrigation fund? Or do we just leave it? Uh, do we run a little bill that says that? I, I guess I'm just asking the committee if I'm the only one thinking that we ought to give access to our game and fish to some fund, um, give our governor the ability to go grab some if we need it. Senator, I share your thoughts. I've all, I have thought since day one that the water accounts were the logical source to, to provide a a trust or an emergency fund for a, an aquatic invasive. And granted, we, we're also dealing with terrestrial invasives, but that's not our purview today. Um, so I don't disagree with that, that thought. Uh, but I, yeah, I don't know. We could certainly, the chairman and I could explore that idea with select, uh, with the other committee and see what their thoughts are. Uh, and we, that might be our best first steps. I, I think we could just do that informally if, if I would just ask the, the chairman to reach out to the select committee, see what the thoughts are, uh, that, that would require just a couple of, couple of lines of language change. 
uh, to allow for that fund to be used in that manner if needed. Mm -hmm. And um, if it takes something else, we could take it up in the second meeting, maybe of our committee. I, I don't disagree. Committee, are you all okay. good with that? We have homework, mm -hmm. you and I. Mm -hmm. Okay, it is 12.08. Let's break for lunch. It'll be a shorter lunch, but we'll stick to our schedule. We'll be back at one with more from the Game and Fish. Thank you, Director. Mm -hmm.